Good morning. The Tuesday, October 17, 2017, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now be called to order. We'll uh, begin with a uh, moment of silent reflection for all of our first responders, being followed by an invocation by none other than Jeffrey R. Smith, our Clerk of the Court and Controller, and uh, Commissioner Peter O'Brien, our Vice Chair, will lead us in the pledge. Please rise. Once again, I ask you all to uh, join us in a moment of silent reflection in, in support of all of our first responders who serve us every day. Our dear Heavenly Father, as Commissioner Flesher said, we do lift up all of our first responders as they sacrifice every day for us in so many ways. Lord, in your word in 1 Corinthians, you say, let everything that you do be done in love. Lord, I thank you for these commissioners who have dedicated themselves to service in this county. I thank you for people like Freddie Wolfolk and Wolford Hart and the leaders of this community. Um, Lord, just ask, I ask a special blessing on them as they make decisions that affect us all and give them your wisdom and your guidance. Lord, I ask a special blessing on all the military that's serving around the world. Be with them, can protect them, and give them your strength as they serve us. Lord, this country is so divided. I just pray that in love that we can all come together and do what we can for our fellow man in love. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chair. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, commissioners, any uh, additions, uh, deletions to the agenda at this time? Uh, is there a consent agenda item that, uh, yeah. Council? We've got a consent agenda item uh, 8J that we'd like to pull for discussion at that time, but we can deal with that under oh. the consent agenda. Okay, it's gonna be pulled for discussion. Okay, is there anything else? Move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. That's a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Four to zero with Commissioner Solari absent on assignment. Next item is uh, um, proclamations and presentations. Is a presentation and proclamation designating the month of October 2017 as Indian River Family History Month. Commissioner Adams? Yes. Um, is Ms. Garber or Birdsall or Case, would you like to yes, come sure. on up while I read the proclamation? It's my pleasure to read a proclamation designating the month of October 2017 as Indian River County Family History Month. Whereas the Indian River Genealogical Society has completed the cemetery project as its way of paying it forward to the community and residents. All cemeteries in Indian River County have been included and those individuals interred therein remembered for posterity. The database is available to the public, includes information and photographs, and resides on the Society's website at www.irgs.org. And whereas, for the past 30 year, 34 years, the Indian River Genealogical Society, as an organization, furthers genealogical research and promotes interest in family and local history, providing lectures, workshops, and seminars educating the public. And whereas the Indian River Genealogical Society provided grave row markers to the Gifford Cemetery Association and encouraged the recognition of veterans buried therein. And whereas the Indian River Genealogical Society has helped preserve the legacy of local veterans by researching, organizing, documenting, and articulating the story of the men honored on Veterans Memorial Island Sanctuary. 
and whereas the Indian River Genealogical Society has consistently assisted and supported the Julian W. Lowenstein Archive Center and Genealogical Library at the Indian River County Main Library with volunteers, assistance, books, and equipment. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the board designates the month of October 2017 as Indian River County Family History Month and hereby congratulates the Indian River Genealogical Society on its work and successes in Indian River County for over 30 years. Adopted this 17th day of October and signed by all five county commissioners. Okay. Welcome and thank you. Would you like to say a few words about the project? And what yes, you guys please. Doing? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Adams, and commissioners as president of the Indian River Genealogical Society. I'd like to thank you today for this proclamation. Uh, the society initiated the cemetery project in November of 2013 with the Sebastian Cemetery and ultimately expanded to cover 10 cemeteries and generations of residents. Four years later, almost 18,000 interments have been identified, documented, photographed, and digitized on our website. Those individuals interred in these cemeteries will be remembered for posterity, and the information is available for everyone to use, whether to research one's own family history, to virtually visit the gravesite of a loved one, or to research the history of the people of Indian River County. The project began under the leadership of then President Bob Satola. Assisted in large part by a dedicated team of 30 volunteers, they carefully identified the people buried in a cemetery, located their grave sites, photographed existing gravestones and markers, then transcribed and ultimately digitized the information. And we intend to continue to add to this online database and keep its information up to date. Our mission as a genealogy society is to promote interest in family and local history. Beyond the cemetery project, we offer lectures, workshops, and seminars to educate the public on how to research and preserve one's own family legacy. And we're proud to support the work of the Genealogy Department and Archive Center of the Indian River County Library. Uh, we're very grateful for the county's recognition of our work, and thank you very much. Thank you for your work. Um, you know, the word genealogical society is a, uh, it's a Latin derivative that uh, a lot of people have trouble saying. <laughs> <laughs> However, when they think of genealogical work, they think of Indian River County. And that's because of what you all do. And I, I, I think that it's not just something that local folks like to come to the library to work with, but uh, I think that people travel great distances because of the abundance of information and the dedicated volunteers and staff that you have in order to assist people in finding their past out. I mean, they can go on the internet and do that little thing there and send off some money, but it's got to be a lot more rewarding being able to be in the library and finding out your past as an archeological dig, so we appreciate it. Well, for us older people, it's an archeological dig. <laughs> you no, know, for a New Yorker, you said that pretty well. <laughs> archeological or dig? Genealogy. Gene <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming down this morning. Looks like somebody would like a photo. Looks like we're getting a photo. Yes. Come on down. Come on down. You work every day. St. John. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The uh, next item is a presentation proclamation designating the day of October 20, 2017, as Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Day, and wear pink in Indy River County, Florida. And that will be presented by Vice Chairman Peter O'Brien, who incidentally is wearing some pink. I'm wearing my pink. 
unfortunately my hair washed out, but I'm getting it redone. So I'm going to. You, you can always get a touch up, Commissioner. I, I am and I didn't think I was going to be able to say that about. Uh, Commissioner Adams, and, and she has her pink highlights still going there. And uh, but we, uh, we're all in for pink. So. Jeannie, come on up. Is anybody else with you, Jeannie, or just you? I stay, you know. Uh, when we do pictures, I actually have uh, some of my. We'll have them all Pink come up. Sisters. They, they can come up and stand with you. Come on, ladies. That work here and that are part of my support group as well. Very good. So let me uh, read this proclamation, Jeannie, and then we'll certainly be very happy to hear a few words from you and your, your group there. Uh -huh. okay. This is a proclamation designating the day, October 20, 2017, as Breast Cancer Awareness Wear Pink Day in Indian River County, Florida. Whereas breast cancer is a malignant tumor that starts in the cells of the breast, and then this group of cancer cells can grow into, known as invade surrounding tissues, or spread, metastasize to distant areas of the body. And whereas the disease occurs almost entirely in women, but men can get it too. One in eight US women will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. A man's lifetime risk of breast cancer is about one in 1,000. And whereas in 2017, an estimated 252,710 new cases of invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in women in the US, along with 63,410 new cases of carcinoma in situ which is non-invasive, an early form of breast cancer. About 2,470 new cases of invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed in men in 2017. And whereas for women in the U.S., breast cancer death rates are higher than those for any other cancer besides lung cancer. About 40,610 women in the U.S are expected to die in 2017 from breast cancer, though death rates have been decreasing since 1989. Women under 50 have experienced larger decreases, and these decreases are thought to be a result of treatment advances, early detection through screening, and increased awareness. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners in Indian River County, Florida, that the board does hereby designate the day of October 20, 2017 as Breast Cancer Awareness Wear Pink Day in Indian River County to continue increased public awareness of breast cancer and to promote research for treatment and a cure adopted the 17th day of October, 2017, signed and endorsed by all five county commissioners. And Jeannie, I know there's some some grim statistics in there, but also the, the positive news of a decreasing death rate. Yes. And hopefully one day with more awareness and screening and research, mm -hmm. we'll have this thing beat. Yes. So tell us what, what okay. we're gonna do to get there. Okay, um, my name is Jean Brazette, and I'm um, honored to be here today with my, I call them my pink sisters, but um, some were co-workers and good friends, and then others are part of a support group that I've been in ever since uh, a few days before my first chemo treatment, um, which is five years ago this July. So on positive light, we're all surviving. And part of it is because of the tie you're wearing there. Um, for me personally, <clears throat> I've, had, um, I've had the big fear of it coming back um, 18 months after I initially was diagnosed and, um, and I still go to treatment to this day um, every three weeks and every four. But one of those treatments, um, number one, by God's grace, I'm here. But two, he allows physicians and everybody else to create things. So the Real Men Wear Pink campaign is by the American Cancer Society. And the American Can one of the things that was uh, invented by a scientist that was funded research by the American Cancer Society is one of the drugs that I'm on, on an infusion every three weeks. If 10 years ago, um, by statistical data, I wouldn't be here um, because of my aggressive uh, cancer that I was diagnosed with. Um, if it wasn't for that drug, which is Herceptin, the American Cancer Society's research and funds um, invented that. 
So I'm thankful for that. And um, you have to be thankful every day and be grateful. I'm very grateful that the, our Board of County Commissioners, that all of you here and everyone here um, supports it. I would say that if you asked um, anybody in this room to stand that's been touched by breast cancer, there'd be a lot of people in here, not just survivors, but on behalf of them and their caregivers, their loved ones, um, I just thank everybody for their support and their prayers. Um, I also wanted to just do a special thank you, being it's a public meeting to, um, is Deputy Floyd, Deputy Floyd is, um, they did this pink badge this year campaign, Sheriff Laura and Eric Flowers, Deputy Floyd, of course I'm sure he was probably one of the first ones to put that pink badge on, and, um, and I'm, I love it, I love that pink badge. And uh, I, I'm like, okay, you need to wear a different color badge every month, but that'd probably get too much for the budget there. But, um, but and then they also did a, uh, a rest breast cancer unlock the cure pin, which I'm gonna figure out how I can get one of those. Those are for uh, civilians as well as their staff that aren't deputies. So um, thank you to your staff too, to uh, a special thanks to Misty, uh, to Maya Miller, to, to the people behind the scenes that, um, that put it in their tickler fire, whatever, to remember to do this. Um, and uh, I'm just grateful to have been here that long as a career, and I'm grateful to be here today, and will continue to do so as long as I'm asked. I'm, I'm humbled and very honored. And I don't know if anyone else, oh, and I have something for you when we come up, but something yeah. little, I don't know if you well, want to say anything. Jeannie, you uh, had, had mentioned the Real Men Wear Pink campaign, and uh, I am taking part of that this month and uh, Major Flowers is also part of the group doing that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rendell from the school board, Chief Curry uh, from the Bureau of Police Department. So a lot of folks, um, you know, standing up to yes. uh, bring awareness and help raise funds for this. And, and just a shameless plug, I am hosting a uh, fundraiser this Sunday mm -hmm. up at the Tiki Bar and Hut in Sebastian. Mm -hmm. So if you all wanna wear your pink and come out, it's a beautiful location what right there Sunday? in the- this coming Sunday from 1 to 5 at the Tiki, five. Tiki Bar and Grill um, up there in Sebastian, right on the river. It'll be beautiful. Um, we'll have lots of fun and raise awareness and bring the pink out. So Thank you so hopefully much. Hopefully you all can come up this and join me mom. up there. This is my biggest fan right here, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. You know, Jeannie, oftentimes you, you don't... Uh, you don't understand or appreciate the magnitude of the impact of this life-changing event unless you are directly affected. Right. And unfortunately, I have been a few times. But I want you to know that you sharing your experience while you were employed here and all of these individuals decorating the booths and working the program and being your very best in support group that you could have ever asked for has brought a new heightened awareness within Indy River County, not just in the building. And I believe that many people know of the great work that you have done and now it's, it's broadening and broadening and look, now it's on our deputies. So you've made a tremendous mark and an impact, and I want to personally thank you for sharing your story from the onset. Many people for years kept this type of scenario very close to the vest, right. very quiet, mm -hmm. and that wasn't the manner in which to take, and I think we've learned, and we've learned through your actions and so many others, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeannie, come on up. So you're painting the town pink on Sunday. We are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we, we all <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you so much. Okay, watch it. I uh, well, she's not employed anymore. So, thank you, mom. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Who's running the ship? Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Your booth is the one I was talking about. You know it. You are. Uh, one pinker. It is pink. That's it. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. God be with you. Good morning. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It means a difference. Yeah, we... Changing it. Changing it. Susan, you're going to have to pin all of us because we're not. We're not capable of You're doing it. Oh, we can. <laughs> You're not a phlebotomist? Ladies, come on back this way. Jeannie, move everybody to your right a little bit. There you go. There we go. That's it, ladies. Nice. Looking good. <laughs> Got to be one more. Sorry. Thanks, team. Thank you, ladies. The next item on the agenda is a presentation proclamation designating the month of October 2017 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And Commissioner Zork will have the honor of presenting that to uh, Tom Manwarning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Tom. I'll read the proclamation, and then I Whoa. see you have uh, Dylan's shoe size up on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the podium there. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. This is a proclamation designating the month of October 2017 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Whereas each day in America, four women are murdered by their intimate partners. And whereas every nine seconds in America, four women are abused by their intimate partners. Whereas one in three American women have been assaulted or beaten by a husband or boyfriend. And whereas National Domestic Violence Awareness Month provides all Americans the opportunity to recommit to ensure that every relationship be violence free. And whereas all domestic violence victims deserve a safe place where they can live with respect, resources, restoration, and justice. And whereas in any River County, Safe Space Inc. joins forces with law enforcement, victim service programs, criminal justice officials, social service organization, and concerned citizens throughout the county to fight domestic violence. And whereas together their commitment and compassion to help to ensure that our community step community steps forward to lend a hand to domestic violence victims in need now therefore be it proclaimed by the board of county commissioners that the board recognizes and honors the month of october 2017 as domestic violence awareness month and furthermore expresses our sincere appreciation for those committed to promoting peace and preventing domestic violence in our community adopted and signed this 17th day of October 2017, signed by all five county commissioners. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, sir, and thank you, commissioners. Um, creating awareness is so important because victims need to know that there is help and empowerment available to them. Um, the proclamation shared some national statistics. I'd like to share a few about our own area. Last year, there were over 2,500 reported cases of domestic violence in our three county service area, including 500 in this county alone. Those statistics are really quite frightening when you consider that research shows that less than half in, of incidents actually go reported. So you can see that the magnitude of this problem. Safe Space is the uh, Treasure Coast only certified domestic violence center. We provide safety, support, and education through emergency shelter, supportive living, and non-residential crisis intervention, sometimes known as outreach services. We're dedicated to saving lives and serving the community, offering hope, healing, and change, empowering victims to create an independent life free from violence. In its last fiscal year, Safe Space helped over, helped over 4,500 victims and children through our emergency shelter program, through our um, outreach, and through our 24-7 crisis hotline. We provided over 15,000 safe nights last year 
to women and children in our emergency shelter. And in fact, last night we had 54 women and children resident in our emergency shelter. 10 women in our supportive extended living facility and hundreds of other women, men and children working in outreach or not needing residential shelter services but experiencing domestic violence, literally hundreds. Um, our residential programs are usually filled to close to capacity and half of those we shelter are typically children. Domestic violence can happen to anyone. It could be happening right now to someone you know. Um, I know many commissioners have participated in the, the Red Shoe Walk. I have for many years. We'd ask that you might join us on Saturday, um, October 28th at 10.30 at the Indian River Mall. It's nice, it's inside. Um, those of you who've walked in hills before and have had to walk through the grass know how hard that is, right? When you start digging in and the shoe starts coming off, so we'll be at the mall. Um, and please to show up if you can. And I know several commissioners have been here. Well, Brian and Commissioner Flesher have been here. I don't know if, Tim, you've been. I've, I've, um, you know. They're very comfortable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just come out. We'll have extra shoes for you. And uh, we promise a big crowd and a, and a very happy and upbeat day. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our significant supporters in this community. Um, I'm a little lonely today and all by myself because our board members are exercising their due diligence at our monthly board meeting. But I would like to thank our Indian River County um, board members, uh, past president and current board member, Linda Hengerer, uh, Tony Abraham, who is director of membership for the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce, Karen Frankie, who's station manager of Treasure and Space Coast Radio, Angela Novak, who's a co-owner of Filthy's Fine Cocktails and Southern Social. And uh, someone not at our board meeting is uh, our current president, Major Eric Flowers, who I believe is at the FBI Academy. So they work very hard. Uh, we're very well represented. In fact, uh, even though we are a three-county organization, the last three presidents of our board have been Indian River County residents, including me, two ago. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Jeff Smith, Clerk of Courts, and Sheriff Daryl Law for their ongoing and critical support. And finally, some of our major um, funding organizations, the John Isles Island <laughs> Service League, the Johns Island Foundation, the Grand Harbor Community Outreach Program, the um, Indian River Community Foundation, and most significantly, the United Way of Indian River County. Uh, without the support of these groups and of these people, so many of our neighbors, friends, and perhaps family members would have no means of escape from this frightening day-to-day -day existence. Thank you so very much for the awareness through the proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is not yours, but you hold this one. Oh, okay. yeah, Dave. <laughs> Who's is that? That's, the next, that's a red hot one, too. We'll right. talk about but that. Just, we charge by the word, Tom, so you don't want the long one. And you have one for everybody's size. Thank you. We do. We do. I always am so amused at the read the name of the, since you do well with words. Oh. <laughs> read, read the name of the magazine. Look what you started. Here we go. And that is La Dame. La Dame, sir. La Dame. Yeah, one, would, one would expect La Dame, but it is La Dame. I think these come, they have a special name. What is <laughs> It's it not back. one of those Cinderella stories. Step away from the shoe. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it, you know, this has been a, a pink to red day, and now we're going to go with a red hot proclamation. It's almost like Valentine's Day. We feel the love. We have a presentation proclamation honoring Freddie Woolfolk for his service at the Gifford Youth Achievement Center. I have the honors of presenting this red hot proclamation. We're gonna have to ask Freddie about the red hot 
thing. Now that I've mentioned it, just happened to. Well, Freddie, uh, l let me present a proclamation first, and then we'll talk. Let's see. This is honoring Freddie Wolfhawk for his service at the Gifford Youth Achievement Center. Whereas Mr. Freddie Wolfhawk has faithfully, diligently, and tirelessly served the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, formerly known as the Gifford Youth Activity Center, for 20 years beginning October 1st, 1997, as a guiding force in the development and direction of the Center for the Benefit of the Children and Residents of Indy River County. And whereas Mr. Wolfhawk coordinated with Dr. Ronald Hudson, Dr. Bill Nye, and Danford K. Richardson, founders of the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, to develop the programs to better serve their children, adults, and seniors in the Gifford community, and to help improve graduation rates of African American students in Indian River County, which has dropped to as low as 23% and has rebounded to over 77% today. Whereas Mr. Wolfhawk began the center's first director of programs development in 1997, overseeing the coordination and the construction of the center as well as the growth of the Gifford uh, complex, which includes the Gifford Park, we'll have to talk about that in a minute, and the Gifford Community Center and the Gifford Aquatic Center. Whereas Mr. Wolfhawk, past president and current vice president of the Progressive Civic League of Gifford, continues to work for the betterment of the lives of the Gifford citizens through organizations like COPE, Community Oriented Policing Enforcement, and the United Way of Indian River County, Habitat for Humanity, Treasure Coast Crime Stoppers, and the Youth Council Korea Source, and numerous additional organizations. And whereas the Gifford Youth Achievement Center is a 501c3 non-for-profit agency that is sole purpose to enhance the academic achievement of the children in, this, in the Inner River County and enrich the youth and the adult success in life as well as and provide programs and activities for adults and senior citizens in its facilities, which contains classrooms, computer labs, and the county library, and an indoor gymnasium. And whereas Mr. Wolfhawk continues to work to support the mission of establishing a partnership among for youth, adults of the Gifford community, and surrounding municipalities of Indy River County, and to encourage the development of self-esteem, teach character, and encourage every individual to reach his or her ultimate potential with God's guidance. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indy River County, Florida, that the Board applauds Freddie Wolfhawk for his efforts on behalf of the citizens of Indy River County, and the Board wishes to express its appreciation for the dedication and his service that he has given for over 20 years, duly adopted this 17th day of October 2017, signed by all five county commissioners. Wow. Freddie, I, <laughs> I think we covered it. Thank you so very much, Commissioner. I am absolutely honored uh, just to be a gatekeeper in this whole endeavor. Before I go any further, I just want to just ask everyone from the county commissioners, everyone to stand, please. Would you please stand with me? And the reason why I'm asking everyone to stand, these are the shoulders that I stand on. The organization, the individuals who help me to do what I do. I'm simply a gatekeeper. And I've learned by working with these individuals and organizations that in order to get things done, in, in order to draw friends, you have to first show yourself to be friendly. And be, because of you, I'm able to accomplish the things with your help. And I just want to say thank you. And while I got you standing, Joe asked me to explain to you about this thing called Red Hot. So I need your participation quickly this morning. Is that okay? And when I ask a question, I'm going to say, GYC is what? I want you to say Red Hot. 
It's easy, right? Easy. And I'm going to ask you again, G-Y-E-C is what? And you're going to say red hot. Red hot. Then you're going to spell it. G-Y-E-C is R-E-D with a little bit of H-O-T. G-Y-E-C is R-E-D with the H-O-T. Red hot, red hot. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Here we go. Here we go. You ready? Here we go. You can do it. That's right. G-Y-E-C is what? Red hot. G-Y-E-C is what? Red hot. G-Y-E-C is R-E-D with a little bit of H-O-T. It was a little bit of R-E-D with the H-O-T. Red hot, red hot, red hot. You got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for I almost forgot it myself until you caught me <laughs> off. But it is, it, in the River County has afforded that type of atmosphere, that type of environment to exist and permeate throughout our, our county. No difference in Oslo than in Felsman, in Gifford, or in the River Shores, Vero Beach, Sebastian. All are the same. We are Americans working together. And as a gatekeeper, I want to make sure I make that gate open and it swings both ways. Many times individuals have a tendency to want the gate to swing in for them. But it never swings out for anybody else. That's why those organizations that Commissioner Flesher read, the GYEC wants that, that gate to swing with Habitat, Treasure Coast uh, uh, Crime Stoppers, with HIV AIDS Network, all those different things. So what does that have to do with the Senate? Everything. We're all in this together. So I just want to say thank you. I thank my daughter. No, that's not my wife. Yeah, I know y'all going to say that she looked younger than him. Yeah, that's my daughter. She's supposed to look younger. That's bad. Come stand with me, baby. Come on up. This, this is my daughter, Shasta Woolfolk. And, and I tell you, uh, sometimes she's driving the car, my car, and I look and I say, hey, wife. Ain't my wife, that's my daughter. <laughs> but this is my daughter and she took off to be here with her dad. But I just want to say to you, uh, before I go any further, I want to recognize a group of people who really, really should be up here getting this award. And that's the staff from the Gifford Youth Achievements. And would you guys stand and come up with me? <laughs> this is a magnificent group of people. And I give them all the praise, they are, they are great. We have, we have, we have uh, with us here uh, Ms. Angelia Perry, our executive director. We have our volunteer coordinator slash mentor coordinator, Ms. Uh, Millicent Carpenter. We have our executive assistant, Ms. Barbara Pierce, and Ms. Carrie Williams, our counselor slash mental health specialist. These individuals, not only these other two, somebody got to run the ship while we're gone, but these individuals right here are really key in making things happen. So I want to say thank you so very much for this recognition. Uh, thank you, Indian River County, for this recognition. And I see my buddy Mike Redstone, who's been with me since day one uh, with the Rec Department. And that helped us to draw things to the center. And once we got him there with the candy, he had the candy. That's the candy, recreation. We gave him the broccoli, which was the education. So we had the kids to come out. So it's very good. Oh, yeah. I, some, I, I, that's my last one. So thank you. Thank you, Wyatt. <laughs> she said, don't forget the board. I said, I got that. I say it best for last. Our board and our donors have been mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. I've seen institutions start, and six years later, they're gone. But here we are, 20 years later, still standing. So if we have any board members here, or, or volunteers, or anyone else, yeah, board member, Ms. Denise Smith. Thank you, Denise. Any other volunteers? Okay. Ryan, okay, board members. Okay. Jeff, 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 yep. Thank you so much. Jeff, stand up. Stand up. Stand up, the board members. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, stand up. Teddy, Teddy, uh, did you take the floor? These individuals, and, and these individuals have really been instrumental in, in helping to maintain our course of action. And that's why this coming up January 27th, we're going to have a fantastic celebration again. Not for me, not for me, no. This is, good. This is going to be for the, for the, for the GYEC. We're going to have a celebration that's out of this world at Oak Harbor on January 27th at 5.30, at, again, social hours. So we want you to come out and be a part of it. So help purchase a ticket. Uh, that sustainability thing I talked about, if you are planning on buying me something today, don't buy me anything. But take that same money and write it on the bottom of Freddie's Funds for Our Future. You hear that? Freddie's Funds for Our Future. I want that money to go toward that. So we start a campaign right today. You heard it first. Freddie's Funds for Our Future. Those monies will go to help what? Sustain GYC when Freddie's long gone. 
but his legacy lives on. Thank you so very much. Freddie, you, <laughs> you humbly say that you're the gatekeeper, merely the gatekeeper. Well, I, I don't believe that to be correct. I believe that you are the band director, you're the leader, and if you, uh, the conductor, and you have a great group of musicians, and if this was music, we'd have a symphony coming out of the Gifford wow. Youth Achievement Center. I mean that sincerely. Thank you. Every time you visit the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, there's a friendly face, there's a responsiveness, and there's direction. And it starts, even, even for us older folks, the adults coming in, I, it, it, the program is there, so it's got to work for the children because they're sharper than us. If you want to know what's going on, you ask a fifth grader. That's right. <laughs> so if we could perceive that, just imagine the embracement that you're giving to these children, the youth, our future, every day. So gatekeeper, I don't know if that's well, well, thank appropriate. You. Appreciate that. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Squeeze on in tight, everybody in. <laughs> Red hot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One more time for the group, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. The next item is a presentation not by us at the County Commission, but this will be a presentation by Sheila Smith, uh, and she wants to talk uh, about uh, an event on October 21st, which we are proud to talk about. We actually have the, uh, the honoree here today as well with a few of his family members, and that's the dedication of the Victor Hart Senior Community Enhancement Complex. Sheila Smith. You didn't know if you wanted to speak or not. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, good morning. Yes. Michael Zito, Assistant County Administrator. I just want to introduce uh, the working group that has um, prepared for this day. Uh, and thanks to Hurricane Irma, prepared a little longer than we had hoped. Uh, but we're ready for Saturday. And Sheila has asked me to announce uh, the working group that uh, shared in this endeavor, including Donald Hart, Sheila Smith, Leroy Smith, Teddy Floyd, Wilford Hart, Freddie Woolforth, Tony Brown, Larry Staley, Angela Perry, Joe Idolette the third, our staffers, uh, Parks and Recreation Divisions of General Services, of, <coughs> led by David Fleetwood and Michael Redstone, and of course our commissioner, no, no, liaison no. chairman Flesher. Um, sign uh, is being prepared as we speak by Art Craft, and they have um, served us well with a good price point and some donated lighting. Uh, will be installed Thursday and covered until the big event on Saturday. And of course, as you know, we've uh, now merged it with the annual Veterans Barbecue uh, by design because it's going to be a nice uh, after celebration. And with that, uh, the, the, the working group, I won't say, did have had a leader. It was truly a collaborative effort, it but it did have a voice. So 
Well, I've nicknamed her the voice. Uh, <laughs> Miss uh, Sheila Smith. We've got to get red chairs. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I am truly honored to be here this morning um, to celebrate such a great visionary. On Saturday, October 21st, we are celebrating the legacy of an extraordinary man. Who, and and he, he, it, it's a, he, he basically was an ordinary man who did extraordinary things to provide for himself, his children, and the people of his community. He fought so we could be able to stand on a level playing field and the rules be applied evenly. During his era, Mr. Mr. Hart stood up and it could have easily led to his demise because he stood up during an era that Medgar Evers and Dr. King were also fighting for some of the same things that he fought for, for his community. But he stood anyway. And he had to stand on and walk on uncommon roads to obtain common things for his community. I'm ecstatic about the celebration because many of the youth don't know who Mr. Hart is. I saw on Facebook, we, we were talking about the celebration and a young person said, well, who is he and what did he do? And it, it was, I was taken aback because a lot of times in the pages of our history, the works of great men are covered up or passed without somebody acknowledging who they are and what they did. So this day for us acknowledges a great man of our community, a man who stood when everybody else possibly sat down, a man whose family worried many nights whether or not he'd make it home. But he spoke not just for himself, he spoke for all of us to be able to be at a point as, as we are today, this position, to be able to speak in an organized um, government agency like we are standing here today. And so what I would like to say to Mr. Hart before we go to Saturday is thank you. I'm honored to be a part of your history. We are honored to be a part of your history. We worked hard to make sure that our efforts measured up to such a great man. And we are proud to stand on your shoulders and continue the efforts that you started many years ago. Sheila, I don't, yes, dear. it sounded like you covered it. What were we going to talk about on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try. <laughs> Victor Hart. You really shocked me, I'd be honest. <laughs> but I want to say thank you. You know, I never thought being in this kind of community and activity, and nobody never say nothing about you, so I'm kind of a little shaky now. <laughs> but I want to say thank, 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 because that tell me, Victor, a lot of people thinking about you, but you don't know. <laughs> and so for that reason, I, I'm going to say, you all tell me what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I won't do it because I know a anybody see me the first thing they say, please don't, don't start Victor talking. <laughs> so I'm going to stop. <laughs> I just want to say, I just want to say uh, there's one person missing. I know I got brothers and sisters who are not here, but there's one person missing, our mother. Just like to say to the commissioners and all of these wonderful people in this community, understand one thing. What was dad, his body of work, the accomplishments that were made, the sacrifices that were given, he didn't do it alone. There are so many people who back then, most of them educators, couldn't get involved 
because of fear Amen. of losing their job. Now, I know I'm 64. Right. I held signs. This, this man held signs alone. He had me out there. We integrated the J.C. Park. I was right there mm -hmm. with him. I took him to his NAACP meetings across the state. His body of work speaks for itself. Yes. But it didn't have to be acknowledged, and you did it. The five of you, I understood from Commissioner Fletcher, voted unanimously to acknowledge our father's work. And we just want to say thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. And, and one, one, I see my brother get an answer there, but one, one last thing is that you did it in a tangible way. You did it in a tangible way. You, you changed the name of the park, and you put our father's name. Thank you so much. It took a village to make that park, but without your dad, there probably would not be a park. Thank you, Victor. Mr. Chairman, just uh, just remind everyone, 10 o'clock Saturday. 10 o'clock Saturday. At the park, Victor Hart Community Enhancement Complex, formerly known as Gifford Park, 10 a.m., uh, followed by the barbecue. Please join us. Rain or shine, now thanks to the GYAC uh, offering to be the the rain venue. So we're going to we're going to do it rain or shine. Please join us. Outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Zito. Thank you all and we'll see everybody Saturday at the now it's called the Gifford Park. We're going to make some change on Saturday. Thank you. And have a great time. We'll just wait for everybody to. Bishop. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of August 15, 2017. So moved. Second. That's a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. Uh, we now have the informational items, uh, and uh, I did want to uh, pull uh, item H for discussion, and that's the dedication of Deputy Sheriff Gary Chambliss Avenue. I wanted the public to know that it's been many months since we had uh, made a unanimous decision to dedicate the uh, very street to uh, Gary Chambliss Avenue. And uh, within about a week, I want to thank uh, our uh, public works director. Within about a week, the signs were already in process. The following week, we had an abundance of signs and everything was set and we had a map and we were moving forward. Uh, there was a request uh, with uh, the sheriff's uh, input 
regarding the timing. Uh, we had some constraints. And uh, then we had something called Irma arrive, which altered a lot of plans, not only this one dedication. With that, uh, we had uh, determined that uh, after going back and forth with some dates, that October 24th would be an appropriate date. And I spoke with the family. Uh, it, it would work. Uh, but uh, the sheriff had uh, the October uh, 4th date for National Night Out an annual uh, event, which I want to encourage everybody to go to, but I just said October 4th. Well, it had to be delayed because of concerns for the storm as well. So with that, uh, that date has been set for October 24th, coincidentally at 5.30. And if you read the agenda, the backup says 5.30 for this event. Um, I, I would encourage everybody to go to the sheriff's event and to see the great work that the sheriff's office is doing and uh, shout out uh, about our wonderful county and, uh, and see all the, uh, the men and women who serve and the hardware uh, that uh, is, is abundant uh, in the community. And I think the sheriff would like to have everybody, as many people as possible out there. It's a great annual event. And uh, with that, uh, I spoke with the family as well, and uh, it, it appears that October 25th, the very next day, is a very appropriate day and a workable day for the family. I want to put the family at the foremost of the decision. So with that, uh, I'd like to adjust that date to October 25th at 5.30. Sheriff, is that uh, an appropriate time? Your call, Chairman. Appreciate it. I, I, think, I think that would be, be good if anybody's got any input here. Uh, if anybody from the audience has input, I did discuss it at the, uh, the meeting uh, last night in the Gifford community, and uh, everyone seemed to be responsive to that date. And that will be Wednesday at, uh, uh, on the 25th, October 25th, and we will be uh, forming up, uh, again, we say forming up, this is, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a casual event. Uh, we will have an invocation, of course, and a few words, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about um, the wonderful life of Deputy Sheriff Gary Chambliss on Tuesday, uh, on Wednesday, October 25th at 5.30 in front of Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church at 4465 28th Avenue. That's just down the street from the Gifford Middle School and uh, there will be a sign uh, that will be in front of the, the church and that's where we will do the dedication and then we'll begin the process of, with the great assistance of our Public Works Director and his team, and we will be dedicating the entire street as Gary Cham Deputy Sheriff Gary Chambliss Avenue on that date. We hope that everybody can come. And uh, do we have anything else? That's at 5.30, 5.30 on Wednesday, October 25th, just right down the street from Gift Middle School. It's easily found, and we'll all be there. And I hope uh, that you'll join us in honoring uh, the Chambliss family and Gary Chambliss and dedicating this street as an avenue to his life. Thank you. And uh, I'd also like to, uh, Jason, if we could uh, do uh, a, a blast out there and post it on the uh, website as well. We, we will get the information out there on the website. Get the information out. I want as many people to know because there's been some delay and changes and I think it's most appropriate that uh, everyone knows there's a lot of people that would like to know and I'll, I'll call upon the uh, Pastors Association too as well. We'll do our best to get the word out. Thank you. Is there anything else on the, uh, uh, on the items? Chairs? I'd like to just highlight a couple items. Sure. Um, item D is paychecks for Patriots and this is a um, hiring event for veterans and that'll be um, Thursday, November 16th at the Port St. Lucie Community Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So all veterans out there, if you're looking for work, 
Um, this is the place to go. Thursday, November 16th, 10 a.m., Port St. Lucie uh, Community Center. Item F, um, commissioners, I'm sure a lot of you have gotten calls that I have with complaints about the, the Hurricane Irma brush cleanup. And this is a thank you letter from Mrs. Sandra Largent um, for the cleanup job we did at 27th Avenue and 8th Street. So it's always nice to get a, uh, a compliment. And item E is a, a lot of the commissioners here will remember uh, Commissioner Paula Lewis from St. Lucie County. Yep. They are taking a um, converted uh, police substation and making it a, a, a branch library. And that ribbon cutting and dedication is Tuesday, October 24th at 1030. And just wanted to bring that to y'all's attention. I know I okay. served with uh, Commissioner Lewis um, for many years in the Florida Association of Counties Board of Directors. And when we had some joint meetings with St. Lucie, she was always you know, very reasonable and, and good to work with. And um, I, I think it's great that they're um, uh, celebrating uh, Commissioner Lewis's service to her community. So I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. And that is all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Anything else? With that, let's move on to the consent agenda. Commissioners, is there any uh, items of interest that uh, We'd like to pull for further discussion. Mr. I understand that we're pulling item J as the amendment uh, for the, uh, the standard uh, form of grant agreement. Mr. Chairman, I had a request to pull item I from consent. Item I. And Mr. Chairman, 8D. And D Delta. So that's D Delta, I Indigo, and J Juliet. Is there anything else? from the commissioners. Is there anybody from the audience in attendance that uh, wishes to have an item pulled for further discussion? Seeing none. Move as amended. Second. That's a motion by uh, Commissioner Zork, seconded by myself. Uh, any further discussion amongst the board? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries four to zero with Commissioner Solari absent. The first item that uh, was pulled on item D Delta, the approval of the uh, resolution uh, establishing fair market rental rates uh, for housing choice voucher program. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this may be, not sure if this is more of a question for Stan, but maybe Bill, you can chime in. I'm in, I'm in support of this particular agreement, but I have received um, some inquiries and have met with some residents uh, who fall into the USDA rent program and I don't know if there's any tie-in between the HUD rates and the rates that the USDA pays on similar type of projects it, instead of the the applicant or the tenant being qualified the unit becomes qualified but the rental rates seem to be much higher on the USDA rates than what what are listed here for the HUD and I just didn't know if there's any relationship between what USDA does with their rental assistance program and the HUD program that we have here. Um, Bill DeBrawl on behalf of the county attorney's office, I'm not aware of the USDA program. Uh, this is the program that the county uh, uses with its uh, rental assistance program. Okay. Stan, if you could shed any light on it, I would be appreciative. I too, Bill, do not have okay. uh, that information on the USDA, but C Commissioner, I'd be glad to, to, okay. to get that information yeah. back to you and copy the other board members so they okay. know as well. And we'll see. Um, I, I just met with them, I think it was on Friday, so it was after the, the deadline date. But, um, but with that, we'll get the information to you too and see what other right. information we can learn about how that program runs and what are the rates being uh, offered through another federal agency. That'd be great, thank great. you. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll move for approval. Second. That's a motion by Commissioner Zork, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion amongst the board? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. Item I, Indigo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson had asked me to pull this, so Bob, if you'd like to come up and let us know your concerns here.
Bob Johnson Corwin subdivision. Uh, I have a um, I have not seen a uh, public announcement uh, for this item to be uh, uh, on the uh, public uh, for comment. I think Stan has an answer though on this one. This one I do have an answer for. This is a, a final plat. Um, although this project, Grand Harbor, is a planned development and there's the initial phases of approving a, a planned development that do require public hearing and public notice, uh, but this is essentially, they're, they're just platting, they're at the end of the development process. The development's actually already occurred and the board is approving a plat and there's no public hearing uh, that's notice that's required for that. It just occurs at a public meeting, which is what's happening today. But there, there was an August 14, 2014 P and Z meeting. Correct. That would have been a public hearing when the original PD came through. When the, the, the preliminary plat was approved, actually, um, it was after a public hearing had already been held. So yes, there was a public hearing for this specific project, but it was years ago. At that particular time, uh, there was a, um, uh, an organization in uh, Tallahassee which required the county uh, to have the state approve. Uh, a lot has changed since then and uh, I don't think the uh, item has changed for the uh, for a public to have a comment on uh, changes that may have taken place from the time this was uh, approved and this uh, action that's being taken now. In other words, why, why would we, if that's approved now, why would this come before the uh, county for approval now? Right, this is just the last part of the process for actually filing a plat on the public records to create lots and streets and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, this is just the, the end of the process and probably one of the last plats in Grand Harbor. But this plat layout does not deviate from what was proposed back when, you know, public hearing was held years ago. So did the uh, county commissioners approve this as a PD in uh, 2014, I think you said? Yeah, actually the initial approval was back in the 1980s. Uh, there have been some updates through public hearings since then. Um, so I think actually the public hearing was before 2014. It's, it's been several years since, um, since the overall project layout was last updated and approved. So all those changes that took place, this. Uh, uh, was not this uh, is not required to have a, uh, a county commission. I don't understand why this is even before the county as an agenda if uh, it's not necessary for public comment. Well, public comment is allowed at a public meeting, which is what's happening right now, but uh, the a public hearing requirement is is not required for a final plat because they're just following a layout that was previously approved by the Board of County Commissioners. Well, I, I tend to disagree. I think this is uh, uh, considered a public uh, meeting. The county is asked to make a uh, public uh, uh, approval of it, and uh, there was no announcement that this was uh, for uh, review by uh, the public to make any comments on any changes that had taken place. So, uh, thank you very much. And, and Bob, I, you know, this site is zoned for either RM6 or RM8, which could be either six to eight units per acre, and it's coming in at three units per acre. So it's coming in very low density for what the zoning would allow there. And normally, uh, again, when we have the, the, the public hearing at the P and Z for the preliminary plat, things really don't change much from that preliminary plat to the final. And all this does today is then kind of puts in the books all those individual lots. So now a builder can go ahead and build a home on them. And also they go on the tax roll now as individual lots. So it's actually a, a, a bump in the um, assessed value and, and things like that. But really um, there's been no significant change since the preliminary plat. And this just kind of finalizes it and now allows individual construction to move forward. Well, you, you said uh, there wasn't, uh, not much was changed, so it's not, uh, and I'm, my concept of not much is, uh, if anything's changed, 
uh, it becomes a public hearing, and uh, this is not considered a public hearing for whatever reason, so that's all that I have. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and move uh, staff recommendation. Second. That's a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by myself. Any further discussion amongst the board? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. We now move on to item J. Juliet, the amendment for to standard form grant agreement. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just wanted to pull this item for discussion and also one modification to the recommendation. Simply just recommend that the board approve the standard agreement uh, subject to the change that the Exhibit B, which was attached in the backup, actually be modified to reflect the Exhibit B that is attached to all of our agreements. There was a change to Exhibit B that made this a different standard exhibit than any of the others. The exhibit itself, Exhibit B, should stay the same. The only change to this contract should just simply be in subsection 4, which talks about the travel expenses policies. Otherwise, the contract should stay the same as presented to the board, and staff uh, recommends approval as is, and I'm available for any questions. Council, can you uh, expound on the, the uh, advancement of the new uh, regulation? It, it appears to sound as if it's a prohibition for travel. Correct. And, uh, I, I do share some grave concerns, as we do have some organizations, 501c trees, that, uh, but not for without that travel component, they will not be and nearly as effective. And and uh, I, you know, I'd like to know the nexus, as to was this because we have some known or perceived violations or concerns uh, for the budget being good stewards. Uh, but is it is this a shotgun blast approach to uh, ensure that we have compliance as opposed to looking at individual uh, use or abuse or perceived abuse? Thank you very much to the chair. Yes, the standard format is going to be that our agencies that receive the funding will not get travel expenses reimbursed for travel outside of the county. However, as we were going through our applications, we realized that there were two or three entities that actually the travel makes sense. And so we wanted to bring those back to the board on an individual basis so that this board could analyze those requests for travel reimbursement and the ability for those organizations publicly and so this board be aware of it. So this is an example where uh, three organ two organizations, the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce and the Sebastian Chamber of Commerce, which logically would have travel outside of the area to promote the type of travel to our community, it would make sense that those organizations would be allowed to get reimbursement for travel expenses. So this is just a, simply a, uh, an exception to the general rule, which we want to make sure we brought back to the board in full transparency. Well, uh, again, it'll be a, so that would be a, a consent agenda item that uh, would, would go customarily because uh, Sometimes the travel accommodations and arrangements have to be made many, many months in advance. So we will have the perceived needs and it will just m uh, require more documentation for the 501c3 specifically when you mentioned the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce has to have a, a wider scope. Again, we're not talking about um, two week European vacations that, uh, that we hear about in other lands. Uh, we don't have that type of scenario here, and uh, and look, I, I reviewed the uh, the travel uh, path of the uh, chambers of commerce and the two that we have, and uh, those chambers of commerce have been rather limited. As a matter of fact, during the in the past few years, when the budget was paled, they also paled their travel endeavors to a great extent, and we saw the end result was that. We did not have the participation, and especially when we look into tourism or uh, other areas uh, that we want to draw attraction. Uh, ag again, I don't, I don't see that we have tremendous uh, uh, levels of concern, but I, and I appreciate being brought up because uh, being a steward of, I'm looking right at, at Mike, uh, at uh, Smikowski, our Office of Management Budget Director, 
and uh, every time we, we do see any movement, uh, we, we go to Mike and, and take a look at what the expenses are. And uh, he does a fine job and a county administrator. Uh, but I, you know, I, I don't know if this will uh, impede upon any of the process. And I'd like to just hear from uh, the uh, one of the chambers, if, if they could, if, uh, if this would rather work well so that we can have a notice so I, I, don't, I just don't want the action to impede upon their effectiveness. And if it's not going to, then, then we go forward, we'll be good stewards, and we'll just see a consent agenda item that's placed and it, it will be approved or not approved uh, based on the necessity of the, uh, the request for travel. And, and I think that's been staff's attempt is we had that blanket policy that applies to some of our other nonprofits. So if you think about what, what folks are in the business of, we, if we're funding a, a children's services program that's serving children in this community, there's a prohibition on out-of-state travel that we will reimburse for for those programs. However, when you're talking about promoting tourism, economic development, uh, sometimes your constituents that you've got to go to are out of the state when, when there are these, when, when you have conventions where you can get in, where the, where the chamber can get in front of people that can drive tourism or economic development to our area, by necessity they, they sometimes have to go out of state. So this is an attempt to make sure that that is clear in here and I think it's out of an abundance of caution that we've, we've brought this forward to be transparent that this would differ in, in these instances, but uh, we, we think that's what we're, what we're attempting to do is make sure that those things are not prohibited. And it's very clear on that. I just wanna make sure that these agencies go through an application process and they submit their budget for their travel and it is all reviewed uh, by county staff um, for appropriateness. So uh, we, we think it's, it's just kind of the nature of the work that they do that necessitates this. And, and to the chair, ba follow up on Jason's comment, it still contains the provision that all their reimbursable expenses need to be documented, providing the invoices, providing that information to the Office of Management and Budget. We're n the board is in no way uh, waiving that. We're simply allowing for them to get reimbursement for travel expenses. Again, my comments were just, I did not want to impede upon their effectiveness, but again, it's falling in line with what we have to do as a county commission when we travel. I don't, personally, I don't partake in much travel, but uh, over the years, uh, there has been postings as to events that we might, might be able to go to, and we seek approval, and it goes before the board, and we all ha also have public input if uh, it's encouraged, if the public wants to discuss any items as to where we're going. We are fully transparent. It does bring a level of transparency. I just did not want it to bring an, an impedent value to what they're doing, because I, I think that uh, the, uh, the chambers are doing uh, a wonderful job in, in, in bringing uh, Indian River County to the forefront and placing us on the map, specifically when we had harsh economic times. So that's all. Is there anybody that would wish to speak regarding the uh, in, impending regulation? Good morning, Ms. Chandler. Hi, Penny Chandler, Director of Indian River County Chamber of Commerce. Um, I don't think there's anything that would impede um, our activities in, in what is being explained. Uh, we um, are able to furnish the commission office with a listing of those places where we are intending to attend conferences or site selector uh, uh, meetings or trade shows, those kinds of things. We're able to do that far in advance in some cases. In other cases, we have to wait for them to be announced as to where they're going to be. But as far as the expenditures and uh, uh, providing um, uh, copies of receipts and that kind of thing. We do that all the time anyhow. They go to um, the budget office and if there's any kind of issue, Mike gives us a call and we're able to furnish explanation or further um, documentation. So I think it's, I think it's okay. So that this should require just a, uh, a mere written request from the 501c3 to the county administrator? 
Right. Yeah. The, it, we would just normal go through the normal documentation process with, that we've that we've always done. This agreements are just new and formalizing the the process. Thank you. Thank you. Move staff recommendation. Second. Yes. Um, under A, since the, when you read that, it says mileage reimbursement, et cetera, and we've, we've talked about before that there were regulated by the state reimbursement numbers for meals, food, lodging, and mileage, that it's not uh, any of the other recognizable charts. I don't know if it would pay to add the guidance that we're required to operate under and what we're allowed to reimburse under since I don't see that mentioned in the document. I don't know the statute number that that falls under, um, but it does limit. Now I know in city council government, they can go somewhere and have, I shouldn't say, I should say some cities, I'm not gonna say our city for sure, but um, you know, if you go out and have a, a $30 meal, you get reimbursed for the whole 30. We're under the, whatever it is, $12 reimbursement amount. So just didn't want to, I wanted to be clear that it's not whatever the expenses are, it's the expenses under the state statute limitations that as we and others submit our reimbursements back to the county on. Do you know what that is, Dylan? Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson, Carl Wynn subdivision. Is the uh, oh, so Bob? Bob, hold on. D did you okay. get an answer? Not yet. Okay. So why don't we, why, Mr. Johnson? Why don't we let Mr. staff Johnson. answer the commissioner's question before before Penny we take Chandler off? Penny Chandler is going to address Commissioner Zook's. Yeah. Inquiry. Um, I think what your question was is, do we fall under that guideline where certain reimbursable, uh, certain expenses would not be reimbursable? Uh, because it would go over some threshold. Correct. I believe that's your question. Mm -hmm. That's how we operate now. Okay. Um, in, in some regard, I would add to that, that for instance, if a conference that is being held, let's say the governor's conference, if that conference is being held in a specific location and uh, the price of the room exceeds, um, we do try to find another place, it's, it's uh, not always the best way to operate because then you're not with the people that you want to be with to promote. Um, but on meals and all of that, like for instance, um, obviously if our economic development director has a site selector or a manufacturer or somebody that's looking at the area in town and she's trying to entertain those people, uh, taking them out for dinner or whatever, you obviously uh, don't make a very good impression if you're just taking that person to the, you know, to a fast food restaurant, for right. instance, because your threshold is limited for a lunch or a dinner uh, to a very small amount. So in that case, then that's where the private investors would kick in for economic development. They do not for tourism. I think that's an exception. I, I, I think that overall uh, we. Uh, tend to be but very budget conscious yes. and uh, some of the conferences provide meals and none of us are strangers to granola bars. Uh, <laughs> but, you and know, anything that's above, like it, if somebody would go out, uh, say if Allison would be going out for dinner at, uh, she goes to the level and then she pays out of pocket for the rest. Mm -hmm. Right. But th that, that's a promotional endeavor though, that's, that's part of doing that element of business to uh, swoon them. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes, and okay. I just still see if Jason comes up with the actual number. And that, I don't know when that ever evolves that whenever the state well, decides to visit it. I would think that since the chambers are the designated tourism agency for the county and also the designated economic development agency for the county, they are by extension part and acting as representatives of the county so they would fall under that i think that's understood i think it's always been understood mm -hmm. and i i don't think it's i think we're kind of getting in the weeds okay. yeah, yeah we've never we deviated from okay. this it's and, what we yeah. do yeah that's the way we do it yes yeah, that's the way we do it the statute it's 112.061 okay is the statute thank you mr yeah, johnson speak. bob johnson carl in some division <clears throat> Is there any uh, restrictions on this? Is this just uh, uh, within the state? 
uh, and is there a, um, for reimbursement, or is there, uh, say, a trip to uh, California to the uh, conference out there, is that uh, permitted? Uh, what, what are the uh, limits uh, on the, uh, if any? We, we do permit travel here. Um, as, as we mentioned, it's, it's part of their mission to, to go to various events. Some of those are within the state. Occasionally they have, the, they have ones outside of the state, but when you're, when you're trying to attract tourism or if you're trying to attract an employer, you may need to go uh, to, a, to their location or to a trade show that where, where, where the chamber folks can get in front of the right, the right people there. And I, I think they would agree with me uh, that with the statement that the county review process is robust, we make sure that we thoroughly review the, any of those uh, requests beforehand when the budget is submitted and also uh, when the travel actually occurs to make sure that it is in accordance with our, with our policies. Who approves that uh, request? Is that you, uh, Jason, or is that the OMB director? What level is that approval? take place well when the budget is approved uh, for instance that goes through the the TDC on the tourism side and then the Board of County Commissioners for the approval of the budget and then the day-to-day -day review when there actually is a travel that is reviewed by uh, the Office of Management and Budget it is also reviewed by the clerk's office uh, who is Jeff Smith is a separately elected uh, official that uh, reviews any of our activity and, and they review it for compliance as well is there a uh, is there a trip report uh provided by the person that uh, made this trip that uh, shows that they accomplished what they set out to accomplish or who they met with or uh, information like that or they no requirement for a trip report? We review their trips to make sure that they are fulfilling the public purpose that, we, um, that, that they are serving for the county. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to add to this discussion? Given an ample opportunity and seeing none, we have a motion on the floor from Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion here? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. Next item on the agenda is uh, in the office of sheriff is the Indian River County Sheriff Darrell Law application for fiscal year 2017. The Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant. Good morning, Commissioners. As you know, this is a uh, standard practice where we ask for uh, approval from the board for us to pursue uh, federal grants. This is a small grant, around $20,000. We funded through the federal government for ballistic shields and vests to enhance our mission. Move Sheriff's uh, application. Second. Second. That's a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by myself. Sheriff, um, thank you again for participating with the uh, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Grant. Eddie Byrne uh, meant a lot to me personally, and, and I uh, sincerely hope and trust that these funds will be used to the best interest for the citizens of Indian River County. Well, and thank you. And I want to thank Annette, Miss Annette Russell in the back. She manages all of our grants at the Sheriff's Office, which is a very, very busy job. And Congratulations to her. We're saving at least the county residents tax money. So, and good I morning. thank the Byrne family yeah. for uh, sure. creating this. After the vote, I have an unrelated question for you real yes, quick. Yes, sir. Any further discussion here? Anybody from the audience? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. Um, yes, sir. Sheriff, on Thursday up in Gainesville, there is a somewhat controversial speaker coming to campus, yep. um, hitting a little bit close to home to me because I have two sons attending school up there. And I know that the governor has declared a state of emergency for Alachua County, and they're sending in 500 additional law enforcement. <clears throat> or, or any of our law enforcement folks heading up for that? Or? Yes, sir. Actually, I was on a conference call last night. I have one this afternoon. 530 deputy sheriffs throughout the state of Florida, 400 Florida Highway Patrol troopers, uh, and some others mixed in for a total contingency of 1,200. We'll be in Gainesville. Our troops will be leaving at 0700 tomorrow morning. So uh, we, we will be sending? Yes, sir, we will. Okay. 
Well, certainly. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I want to appreciate that and hope everything goes smoothly. And all this is hopefully uh, a Bring lot of preparation problem. for nothing would be the best outcome. Uh, but please pass on to those deputies that will be going up there that our thoughts and prayers are with them Thank and you. make sure they come back safe and sound. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank Have you, a great sir. morning, Commissioner. Thank you. With that, before we get into the uh, lengthy presentation, let's take a brief recess. The meeting will now be called back to order. And the next item is going to be a asset management program services uh, that's going to be delivered by our utilities director. Good morning, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Vincent Burke, Director of Utility Services. Um, back on July 11th, uh, the board approved the final ranking of the RFQ 2017-029, request for qualifications for the asset management program services to assist the Inner River County Department of Utility Services to develop and identify a enterprise-wide comprehensive asset management program. So um, I'm going to just cut right to the chase and say the reasons why we want to do this is to get a better comprehensive analysis of our existing assets, the conditions of those assets, the level of service that we're required to provide, the increased regulatory oversight, uh, and also the tight budgetary constraints that we have to operate under so that at the end of the day we can identify the right project uh, to be done at the right time for the right reasons. So we have an expert in the asset management program. I'm not going to bore you with some of the details, but we have folks from Arcadis here who are the experts that are going to help us. I think walk you through some of the highlights. We're not going to take all of your time, uh, but certainly we're going to turn it over to Celine Heyer, who's a nationally recognized asset management uh, program person, and she has a short presentation for you guys. So bear with me one second, and Celine will walk you through some of these issues. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to talk to you today about the asset management services. As Vincent said, uh, my name is Celine Heyer, and I'm going to be your project manager and also one of the lead technical specialists for this program. Uh, I have about 28 years of engineering experience, and most importantly, 17 years I've been doing asset management. I started off doing it for Hillsborough County uh, with the water utility there in Tampa and uh, for about seven years, and now I've been doing it with Arcadis for 10 years. I do projects nationally, also uh, locally in Florida. Um, I'm tied in a lot of the national committees that come up with the best practices, standards through the American Water Works Association. So today I just want to talk briefly about uh, what is asset management in terms of a formalized program of asset management, how do you implement an effective program, what are some of the benefits from implementing an asset management program, and then more specifically, what are the expected outcomes from the first work order uh, that we are proposing to you for approval today. So what is asset management? And I certainly don't want to imply that the utilities is not managing their assets today, but this is a very formalized program of asset management. So if we go to EPA, EPA defines it as a body of management practices that you can apply across all of your different asset groups where you seek to minimize the total costs of operating, maintaining, and renewing those assets. Uh, it understands that you're working within a limited group of resources for your, your labor resources, and you're really defining and delivering the service levels that your customers and your stakeholders are, and your regulators are requiring using risk to make your decisions. So in a more simplistic way, we're really talking about risk-based decision-making as the foundation of asset management. So the first thing we do is look at what are the levels of service that we are required to deliver. And it's getting to be a complex environment. You've got capacity requirements for new development. You've got increasing regulatory requirements. And you've also got reliability requirements in terms of downtime and outages of, of equipment. 
And so once you define those, then you can determine what is the risk of being able to deliver those levels of service. When we talk about risk, we look at either the likelihood or the probability of the assets failing. And analyzing those, can I meet the capacity needs now and of the future? Can I meet the regulations? Can I meet the downtime or the requirements? And then what is the consequence of those assets failing? Not only from a financial standpoint to responding to emergencies, but also from social disruptions and from environmental impacts. And what that does is if you look at the risk matrix, it allows us to really pinpoint what is the red or critical areas that we can apply our dollars to have an optimized capital plan and also apply our labor resources in terms of maintenance strategies. So how do we implement an effective program for asset management? Well, there's some very good frameworks out there uh, that define what are the elements of asset management. And commissioners, you may be familiar with uh, ISO the, or the International Standards Organization. Uh, they published in 2014 a standard for asset management. Uh, it's similar, it has a plan, do, check, act type process, so continuous improvement is embedded in it. Uh, this particular standard can apply to assets of any type, so not only utility assets, it could be roadway assets, uh, it could be any type of uh, manufacturing facility it, asset itself. And this defines what are the seven core elements to have an overall asset management program so that you have a very defined framework of what needs to be implemented. And you can get certified. If you wish, you can get the ISO certification uh, if you are mature in all of the seven elements that are required. So just quickly, here are the seven uh, system requirements for an effective asset management program according to ISO. Uh, you'll see some similar comp, uh, uh, context here. Obviously, defining your levels of service, understanding your stakeholders, uh, having specific roles and responsibilities assigned to asset management, doing your risk-based decision-making and planning, having good data and IT support systems to help you make those decisions, having written standard operating procedures of how you actually do different uh, procedures in asset management, and most importantly, being able to measure your performance against your goals and your service levels and make continuous improvement. If you have a program and you're not meeting uh, what, it, what you're trying to achieve, make the changes and continuously improve that program over time. There is another framework that uh, was also established to define what is asset management. This is very specific to water and wastewater. It comes from the Water Environment Research Foundation. Uh, this was in 2012. And it's very simple. It's a 10-step process to develop an asset management program, and it really meets four or five core questions. And the questions are very simple. What is the current state of my assets? Do I understand what, what I own, what all, of it, what all of it is, where it is, what is its conditions? Uh, what is my required level of service? How can I meet my capacity, my regulatory, my reliability of, of my stakeholders? Which assets are critical to sustaining my performance? What risk do I have in terms of delivering my service levels? And then knowing my risk, how do I apply my limited resources for capital projects and for operations and maintenance? And then finally, bringing that all together, how can I fund that? And do I need to uh, be making decisions to reduce certain projects and defer projects based on my risk? So what we like to do in terms of uh, following a framework for asset management is really blend both the ISO and the WERF together. The WERF is very specific to water and wastewater, so it fits much better with, uh, with the utility, but then doing the strategic and the continuous improvement process from ISO. So if the utility ever wants to go for the ISO certification, they can have an ISO compliant program. But most importantly, how do we define how we get started? Uh, so what we would do is do a gap analysis. So the gap analysis sounds complex, but it's just we look at where's the utility today versus the best practices that I just talked about, those seven core elements. And there's actually tools that exist out there. The ISO has a gap analysis tool. It's very high level. It has seven categories and 39 questions to define where do you sit in terms of a maturity level of asset management. Uh, you're required to get to at least a maturity level of three to be deemed ISO compliant. There is also a gap analysis tool from the Water Environment Research Foundation. It's called the SAM gap analysis. 
And that is more specific to water and wastewater. It has eight categories and 150 questions. And it's actually an online tool. So when we go through and fill it out for the utility, every other utility that has gone through this process, and there's quite a few in the US, uh, it actually will measure you against the top 10% performing best utilities in the US. So it gives you a little bit of a benchmark to identify uh, where you are today in terms of best practices. And finally, most importantly, how do we begin the process of really transferring the knowledge and the capabilities from our experts in Arcadis to the utilities department so that they can sustain the program over time? Uh, the way we do this is we form work teams, and we form joint work teams on the different asset management topics where we'll have a subject matter expert from Arcadis and we'll have a core group from utilities that will work through the items, uh, either creating SOPs, doing uh, pilot programs, uh, and ultimately we'll be transferring our capabilities to their staff. So we're, we want to work ourselves out of a job because this is not a one-time program. This is a way of doing business. So we want to make sure that the staff uh, can make this change and be able to sustain it over time. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of doing asset management. I know you're probably thinking we're spending a lot of money and we're not actually getting a pump station or a pipe, but there are specific benefits to uh, doing very formalized asset management programs. And I would categorize those in the short term and the long term. In the short term, obviously, as we're going around identifying assets and uh, information about those, the knowledge base of assets becomes improved very quickly, and that can be used to, to start decision making. Uh, you get an understanding of the potential risks to delivering either the capacity needs that need to be provided, the regulatory needs, or the reliability needs, uh, using risk to make decisions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure utilities uses all of their institutional knowledge and their gut feel, but it's, it's a much more subjective or a much more objective process when you can use risk. Risk in dollars is easy. I can compare a pump station need versus a pipe need using risk in dollars without any other uh, information. Uh, effective performance measurement measuring things that make sense, measuring things that will show that you're trying to get to your ultimate service levels or your ultimate goals, and then transitioning from re reactive to proactive, planning, doing planned work versus going to repair things as needed. And then in the long term, there are many additional benefits. Obviously, improved bond ratings, especially if you consider getting ISO certified. Uh, preferred status for state loans, if you are interested in any state revolving loans. Uh, in many states, they're actually requiring asset management programs and as asset management plans. So you'll be a little bit ahead of the game for Florida. And typically, there is a reduction in up to about 15 to 20 percent of your O&M costs annually. And it's not because you're doing less maintenance. It's because you're doing less emergency work. We all know you do emergency work, it costs more. You've got overtime, you have maybe emergency contractors. Uh, potentially, you could have other things like road repairs, uh, uh, time for public notifications. So it's proven doing planned work costs less than doing reactive work. And then finally, service levels, uh, rate stabilization and service level stability. Once we know the condition and risk of our assets and the remaining life, we can project forward over 30 years what are the renewal and replacement costs and funds that we're going to need over that 30-year period. And we can smooth it out. You don't want to wait 20 years and then all of a sudden you've got this huge spike of needs and you've got to somehow find $40 million to do a bunch of replacements. So we can plan that out over time and smooth it out so you don't have any rate spikes. While at the same time uh, keeping your service levels or improving them. So I quickly wanted to talk about a couple of success stories of uh, asset management programs that I actually participated in. Uh, and the first one is probably the biggest success story, and that's at the City of San Diego Utilities. Uh, Arcadis was asked to take a look at a replacement program for all of their asbestos cement water mains, and they had over 2,000 miles, quite a, quite a big uh, system. And so we went through and did a condition and risk assessment. We did risk-based planning, and we looked at their service levels and looked at the amount of funding that needed to be spent over the next 30 years, and our assessment showed them that they only need to be spending about $30 million. Originally, when they were using just institutional knowledge and gut feel, 
they felt they needed to be spending $80 million a year. So it was, it was a very good message that we had gone through this process and uh, had actually identified immediately a savings in the capital needs. Another example closer to home, uh, Toho Water Authority in Kissimmee, Florida. Uh, I worked on another risk-based project there where we went and took a look at all of the pump stations and their treatment facilities that they had acquired uh, from a private utility company. And there was many concerns about the service levels that those particular facilities were providing because they weren't up to the standard uh, of the other facilities that Toho was, was operating. So we were able to create a risk-based capital plan and they started tracking their service levels back in uh, about 2012. And at that time, if you see that little graphic there, a lot of the service levels were somewhere in the yellow and some were actually towards the red, especially for infrastructure uh, reliability. And now, years later, they have been able to almost meet or exceed all of their service levels. Uh, the final example I'll talk about is from uh, Hartford MDC in Connecticut. Uh, by gathering data about their uh, wastewater pump stations, we were able to reduce maintenance costs. And it was very simple. What we did is we plotted the capacity of the station, how big, how much flow was it, was it uh, serving, uh, what was the average age of the station, and now how much maintenance dollar and time was being applied to those stations. And we found that there were several facilities that had very low capacity, were not old, but had amazing amounts of maintenance time being spent at them. And through a few minor capital improvements, we could regain all of that maintenance time to do more proactive programs. So those are just three examples uh, that, I've, that I've worked on. Let's talk a little bit about the, the first work order that uh, is being proposed. So we have six tasks that uh, are in the work order. Uh, the first one is really about establishing best practices and forming the teams that will become those joint teams to bring the program forward uh, and, and implement it. So we'll have staff training on key practices and asset management where we'll provide knowledge transfer to uh, the utility employees and we'll officially charter the teams so that they have a structure going forward uh, and they have specific roles and responsibilities for asset management within the utility. The second piece will work on the gap analysis that I showed you. Uh, we'll be combining the ISO and the WERF gap analysis and we'll come up with, in terms of where they are versus uh, best practices, what are the areas for key improvements over time so that they can meet best practices. We'll also look at IT support systems because those are important. You need to have data to be able to make the decisions and uh, be able to, uh, uh, to do your risk assessment and planning. We'll do a strategy uh, piece where we'll come up with an asset management policy specifically for utilities. What is their mission vision? What is their ultimate overarching uh, goals and objectives that they're trying to meet? So that when we do our improvements, everything is feeding up towards ultimately that mission and vision goals and objectives. We'll also create performance measures to make sure that we can define what does success look like at the end of this program implementation. Then the last three tasks will be creating a roadmap. So from the gap analysis, we'll be prioritizing what tasks need to come first. And when we prioritize it, I like to look at what is the cost to do that particular uh, task, and then what is the benefit or what is the impact to the utility. And we'll try to prioritize things that are low cost, high impact first, and we'll phase the other items in over time. And so we'll be creating this kind of phased roadmap forward. Asset management typically takes about three to five years to really implement uh, a successful comprehensive program. So it's not something that happens right away. Uh, and the phased roadmap will help us prioritize uh, to get to the end point. And then finally, another important thing uh, for this particular work order is to start to get some quick wins. Uh, talking with the staff, we know that they're not using uh, condition and risk to make their decisions today. So we want to jump right in and start developing the procedures and the guidelines of how to do risk assessments uh, for their plants and their pump station assets. So we're going to go ahead and develop those SOPs and those methodologies, and then we're going to do a pilot. So we'll go out and maybe test it out on you know, 10 or 15 pump stations or a wastewater treatment plant. 
uh, to make sure that we have the proof that this concept works well, and we'll use that as an example to start making risk-based decisions. So based on the output of the pilot, we'll say, okay, this is what we think needs to be in the capital budget. These are the areas we need to focus more uh, preventative maintenance or some predictive maintenance. And hey, these are the areas that we probably don't need to do anything. So we'll start that whole risk-based decision-making process. Another nice thing in terms of uh, looking at the task one work order is it's really going to build their asset management plan framework. So one of the, the, the goals at the end of the tasks of asset management is you have this written asset management plan where you're documenting all the things that you're doing in terms of, of your asset management program. So from this very simplistic table of contents that kind of follows those five core questions from EPA, uh, we'll be filling in question two where we're doing our work teams, we're defining a policy, some goals, and we're creating that roadmap of how to fill the gaps in a prioritized way moving forward. Uh, we'll also be uh, working on question four, what is the current state of my assets, what do I own, what is the condition, and that's going to be part of our overall condition and risk assessment methodology and our pilot. Uh, we'll be working on question five, which assets are critical or which are the high-risk assets that are required to sustain my performance. Um, and finally, through that risk-based decision process that I was talking to you about, we'll be able to start identifying what are my best operations, maintenance, and capital strategies based on risk. So we'll get a good chunk of the uh, framework for the asset management plan through this first work order. I'm estimating, based on what I know in my previous experience, that it's probably going to take about three years to do the full implementation of the asset management program. Um, phase one is about 12 months, and typically I would say, you know, there'll be about two more phases. As I showed you before, uh, what we're working for is to transfer our knowledge so that the utility staff for the county will be taking on more and more of the heavy lifting of the asset management program as we move to the other phases of implementation. And that's all I have. We have nope. any specific <clears throat> questions? Well, I, I just wanted to comment back to Vinny. It was brilliant to yield to the engineer for the presentation. <laughs> right on course. She's easier on the eyes than I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I did want to uh, go back to Vinny on one comment. Um, if this uh, project is approved, uh, the funding mechanism for that uh, would be, I, I know it's displayed here in the backup, but can you explain that? Yes, so uh, again, I appreciate you um, alluding to that because we had some uh, dollars that were set aside and approved by the board last year in fiscal year 1617. Um, if the board chooses to approve this today, we're actually asking the board to do a second approval, which is to allow staff to carry over funds that had been earmarked for this effort that were in fiscal year last year that we did not get to, to be able to roll those funds over to be able to come out of our existing account number uh, in the professional services account that we've earmarked. Um, so to combine the dollars that we did not spend last year on this to combine that with some of the dollars that we had earmarked in this fiscal year 1718 to be able to offset the cost to do the six or seven tasks that are outlined in the associated work order and that all comes from the yield from the enterprise fund that's the enterprise fund which it says in the notes that uh, the operating funds are derived from the water and sewer sales that we provide to our customers yes sir so no direct impact in the general fund or uh, or future burden for the taxpayer? None whatsoever, no. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, now we have questions. Yes. Um, when, uh, Celine, thank you very much. And I think this is a great idea. Um, we'll kind of take us into the 21st century. And I, I particularly like, one, the, the proactive versus the react, reactive aspect of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think Vinny's doing a, a heck of a job for us, but he's, you know, he came in a couple of years ago and inherited a system that had a lot of older parts to it before his time. And, and it does seem like we spent a lot of time reacting to things. And, um, you know, through no fault of staff or anything, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. So I think this will really help us have a much better roadmap over what we need to do in, in the schedule. And also how that ties into our 
our future capital spending and you know to make sure that our our rate is appropriate for projected cost and you know have a five or ten or thirty year spending plan um, you know so I see a lot of benefit there just to have that wrapped up but um, Celine the one question is um, so how many total work orders are we looking at so like is work order one phase one and there'll be two more work orders or what would be the approximate total say three-year cost uh, to do this full thing that's a hard question because we haven't really gotten into the work teams to see what amount of future work that utilities will be able to take on the goal is ultimately to you know pass the knowledge on to, to utilities and have them take over but I would assume there would be at least two more work orders um, one per year you know uh, value probably going down each year as utilities would take on more of the burden okay All right. thank you so I have Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Any yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, also want to just say for the public, you know, we each met and had extensive meetings with um, with uh, with Vinny uh, prior to today. So that's why some of our questions were already prior answered at, at a prior meeting. Um, I think getting everything in one place, all on the same page, looking at our full inventory, our cost going forward, the age of you could have one section of pipe that's the same age in another location of the community, but because soil conditions, one's failing at a faster rate than the other. And if we're looking at coming up with our renewal and replacement cost as we go forward, we really need to have a, a handle on what we need to do and when, and fixing it from eight to five is a lot cheaper than fixing it from midnight to 4 a.m. So getting ahead of the uh, the curve on that. And depending if there's any more questions, I, I move staff recommendation. Second. That was a great presentation because everybody wanted to be a second. Well, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Zork, uh, seconded by Commissioner Adams, and uh, we'll take honorable mention on the seconds. Uh, you know, oftentimes you strive for a gold star with, it, with whatever you do. And uh, in part of the discussion we've had with Vinny, he said that uh, we're going to see a presentation and uh, he reserved some of his comments but uh, he talked about uh, a blue star program and uh, how this uh, we, we face uh, many unfunded mandates and uh, regarding recycling and another one of his uh, obligations and uh, we understand that there's uh, some stuff coming down the pike uh, regarding the Blue Star commitment. And uh, I just wanted to know if this was going to accelerate it, uh, bring us closer to a reality uh, with whatever we can anticipate coming from the mandates of the Blue Star program. Yeah, we don't know some of the criteria that's set forth and what is being proposed. I would tell you today, I think if it were to come out, we probably would already achieve some of the things that would be coming out. We have a good utility system. Yes, we, have some we good do. People that are dedicated, and I think we have some of the resources that the commission has uh, been allowed to reinvest in utilities. So this just helps us identify what we have, what we don't have through that gap analysis, and then we can then prioritize and implement where we need to spend those dollars. But I would say without knowing right now what those requirements are, we have a pretty good system in place between the telemetry that we have for our data flow systems, the on-call folks that are responding to emergencies, some of the, the, the dollars that we do put into some of these list stations, but um, we're just trying to get a better assessment, as Commissioner uh, Zorka said, to put all that into one area that we can then start to make some better risk-based decisions. So. Um, I think next year we'll know more if that gets passed with uh, some sort of committee that comes out and then there'll be some sort of criteria that by 2019, I think that Blue Star program was initially anticipated to come out, but certainly that's something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on. I think also I had mentioned that, um, or heard mention that Celine had, had said that a lot of states are actually requiring an asset management plan. Florida has yet to require that. You know, we may see that in the next couple of years, but uh, as um, utilities grow and as we continue to grow, I think it's imperative for this enterprise asset management system, not only to help us identify what we know, but help us, as Donald Rumsfeld say, to, to identify some of the unknowns that we don't know about so that we're not spending too much money in one area and not spending enough in another area to make sure that we allocate those dollars appropriately. I hope that answers your question. It's just kind of a roundabout it, way. It but did very well. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, if uh, any uh, comments from the audience? We have a motion uh, on the floor from Commissioner Zork, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion here? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Solari absent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is a discussion uh, by uh, Commissioner Adams on the uh, Roseland Community Building update. Thank you. Um, I wanted to provide you guys with an update on the Roseland Community Building. As you know, um, we had Rich move forward with work order number seven to conduct the building analysis. That's included. It's come back, so that is included and attached to this agenda item for you all to look through. Um, we've also been working with the county historian Ruth Stanbridge to go ahead and update the preliminary site information questionnaire, which is one of the pro one of the first steps in the process of applying for state um, matching grant funding, historical matching grant funding. Um, so we're trying to get everything in line with that. Um, I've spoken with Rich, and I believe that the next step um, after this final the structural analysis has been done would be for him to perhaps get a proposal together for a design um, that's kind of the next step and that would allow us to front load that grant process so when we do apply and or receive that we'll already be able to move forward with that so um, I don't know Rich if, if it would be possible to put a proposal together for design and maybe bring that back in December um, I think that's kind of the next step. What's wrong with November? Well, <laughs> Rich is still recovering from the hurricane, I and I don't <laughs> want his head to pop off. Sorry, Rich. Rich Berger, Public Works Director. Yes, I can get a proposal from MBV and uh, be able to bring it back in December. And you okay. are correct. We're still recovering from the hurricane. <laughs> um, so uh, everything's kind of lining up to go. The grant process will open in May. Um, with a state uh, that's that's standard i think we the county has applied for grants through that process before i think everybody's aware of that so that's kind of what we're aiming for um and then the last thing i have is since the women's club has not been able to utilize the building for several months you know they're still paying that electric bill i've included in the backup i think that's on the dais uh some sample electric their electric bill since february um, it runs about a little bit less than a hundred dollars a month so since they're not able to use that and receive the rents or even be in that building I think it would um, be second. appropriate for us to go ahead and, and absorb that so I would make that motion second um, is there uh, do y'all have any questions on kind of what's going on there or anything any other information I can provide no, I just uh, I'm a little concerned because they do have uh, a tremendous value in the community and uh, a lot of the, the programs, they, they are the, the, the fabric of the, the Roseland community that uh, not meeting, uh, you know, the process for the grant. Uh, that's why I, I joked with you know, what's wrong with November. Uh, but uh, again, uh, you know, the, the process uh, begins in May. And uh, I think uh, Ruth Stanbridge has been extremely successful. So I have uh, great uh, And we've had several discussions with Ruth um, and the Women's Club and are getting all that information together and gathered up so we can present a package. We want to, want to get them back home. Yes, as quickly as possible. And then we'll, uh, discover, we'll have the, the, the match and we'll get her done. Okay? And staff is supportive of, of covering the electric bills because they're not able to occupy the building. So we think that's perfectly reasonable and can absorb that in our budget. Right. I mean, it, it, they'd be paying for something they have no, no access to because we can't have them in the building. Correct. Okay. Uh, is there anything else? Is there anything that the, unless, the group unless would like to speak about? Anybody would like to add more to that. Good morning. My name is Glenn Powell. I live at 12845 Bay Street in Roseland. 
I've been before this board before with a hotly contested issue, and I'm glad to be back about this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the one thing that in the last time I was here that uh, we all agreed on was that uh, we have to preserve the feel of our small town neighborhoods and that's one thing that sort of keeps our county sort of special and sort of prevents the sprawl of the urban areas that we really don't want to be. So I think this is a no-brainer to go ahead and just fix the building. And, uh, you know, it has uh, a fascinating history. I, I had the opportunity to read the first 40 years of the minutes of this club, and these were pioneers of our county. The building is as old as our county, um, and uh, it, 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 we have nothing like it as far as being on the river, on a sandy road, in an old community, with the construction that it is, and, and led by the people who were the pioneers in our county. I found out that there was an issue with the building because I was uh, watching the video of a county commission meeting about a water assessment project in Sebastian to educate myself on how that works. and. I saw the presentation about the building being in such sad shape and it cost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and it can't be occupied and, and uh, you know, I was you know, stunned by that. I, I called the president of the women's club uh, to see what I could do to help because it is such an asset not just to Bay Street and not just to Roseland but to the whole county. And I have experience in dealing with 1920s buildings. It's what I lived in in Atlanta. It's what I restored in Atlanta. I have three of them on Bay Street. And um, we went down to the building, and I sort of expected to see this pile of termites with rot and mold and, and, and sawdust. And I, I, I was relieved that it seemed to be in a better condition than, than I thought it was. Um, so I was really enthusiastic that the county voted in June to spend the $8,300 to really get a, 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 a professional engineer's report of what really is going on. Because, you know, what do I know? I mean, I, I just have my experience. And I actually went to the inspection. I was there for six and a half hours. I watched these two very sharp uh, field technicians do the inspection as they like climbed up in that in the suspended ceiling and open up walls and and they were great. They were really sharp. Um, when the report came in, when when I when Verna gave it to me, I was like, oh God, what is this going to say? <laughs> to say? But I walked, you know, when I read that, um, I got three things in plain English out of the report. The first thing is. They don't build them like this anymore. You know, even though the things might not be built to today's code, it works. You know, there might be a better way to do it now, but what has been going on in that building has been going on for almost 100 years. And, you know, just in the 15 years I've been in the county, that building has survived Francis and Jean and Wilma, Tropical Storm Fay. Matthew and Irma, and you know th that is a strong, unique building. The second thing that I got out of it is that the big issues with that building now has nothing to do with the age of the building. It has to do with two things. One is there's water runoff coming down 129th, and it goes smack dab <laughs> into the building, and that's what has rotted the front sill of the building and has eroded some of the piers, or the ground under the piers. And until that issue is taken care of, any patchwork fix we do to that building will just have to be redone. And apparently some of this stuff was redone like 20 years ago and just has to be redone again. The halicone pairs that were put, on, put in on the eastern side, you know, those are solid and that really arrested a lot of uh, the deterioration. But the water runoff in the front sill of the building uh, really needs to be taken care of. And the second issue with what needs to be done now, and I, I would hate to think that we'd have to wait till November or December or, or to get a grant, is you got to fix the roof. <laughs> I mean, that roof was put on after Hurricane Irma. And this was uh, a dimensional shingle roof that, within the first 10 years, started having problems. And the women's club, as guardians of the building and caretakers of the building, kept reporting the issues with it. So, so now we have a 12-year-old roof that has leaked, destroyed some of the uh, rafters, destroyed uh, the decking of the roof, and it needs to be replaced. And, uh, you know, and, and everything else in that report was, was pretty much cosmetic. 
a lot of cosmetic stuff and, and a lot of serious serious stuff that, that needs to be done, but I wouldn't hold off on fixing the roof. I mean, well, I know, I think Public Works, you guys have been there and and have, well, have fixed the leaks that have occurred since Hurricane Irma, correct? We, we, Commissioner, yes, we've been them. up there. We went up there and we, we plugged some leaks. The roof is in dire straits. We've been up there numerous times trying to address leaks. Um, but just replacing the shingles isn't what the underlying problem is. The flat roof needs to be totally taken, removed and replaced. The underlayment and the actual decking of the roof needs to be replaced. This is just not go rip the shingles off and put a new shingles on it. This is a total reconstruction of the roof and the underlayment and the, and the decking for the roof itself. That's what needs to be done in order to do this. Yeah, and I, I agree with that because I went through that in, in you know, my houses, whether they were built in 1920 or in 1990, if you let the roof go, then it becomes a bigger right. issue. You have to replace the felt or put in the secondary water barrier now, and you have to replace the decking and all of that. But, you know, it just needs to be done. And I, I don't think we should wait until whether or not we get a grant in May to do that. I mean, that's just kicking it down the road. It has to be done. And it's not going to look any different. Um, and the third thing I got out of the report was that the building is safe for occupancy. It might look terrible. <laughs> the sill in the front that's slanted like this uh, is there. Uh, but the report itself spells out in page five, life safety. No items of concern in regards to life safety compliance were discovered at the time of inspection. And, you know, I, I really applaud Public Works for saying nobody can go in the building until we figure out what's going on. And I know that was very unpopular with the, with the Women's Club, but, you know, I think that was the role of Public Works, and it's better to be safe than sorry. And now we have the report saying that it's safe might not look good, <laughs> might have to keep going and, and doing some patchwork, but I, I, I think it's just wrong for, the, for um, the Women's Club not to have use of their building when you know, we have it certified by an engineer. It's, it's safe to use it. As far as the funding for this, uh, Glenn, you know, Glenn, I'm just gonna warn you, you're gonna lose your sponsor of this item in about six minutes. Yeah. So you might wanna condense your comments. Will do, will do. Um, I'll be fast. <laughs> um, I, so I think just stabilizing and securing the building right now is important, you know, patching a, as we've done and figuring out what needs to be done with the, the water runoff. And it's Commissioner Solari who said in March, let's stabilize and secure the building now. And, and funds were released for that. And I would take some of those funds and, and do it. And then down the road, you get the grants, you do all this other stuff, you do the cosmetic stuff. And you look at each of the line items on the engineer's report and you scrutinize them like you would do any expense report. You know, the, it was $45,000 for a roof. And that building is 1,400 square feet. And I've replaced roofs on buildings that size with the decking, fixing the beams, putting in the secondary water barrier, putting on metal roofs, and, and it's a fraction of that. So um, again, I, I want to um, thank everybody on the, on the commission and, and county staff for realizing that this is an important valued asset to our community, and it's certainly a lot easier talking about this project uh, versus others. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the, the future designs. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Rich, anything further? No, sir. Commissioner Adams. Anybody else want to? No. All right, well. One, uh, one short question. Rich, on that comment on the life safety, I think I didn't read it necessarily the same way. I think it meant that there was no life safety structural changes that needed to be made to bring the building to compliant, but I didn't know if that meant it's safe for operational use, but I'll leave that up to you what your thoughts are on that comment. My opinion is, is the building is not safe for occupancy. We have a hole in the floor in the southeastern corner. Um, the floor is not stable when you walk in the door. The concrete for the access is not really stable and it's not handicap accessible. Right. And with the other issues in the, in the um, building, including 
the minor settlement that was still occurring that we need to take care of with this project. And it is my opinion that this building is not safe for occupants. And I, I think that's it, how I read it. That it, I think what that comment was that we don't have to put in something structurally correct. different to be life safety compliant from the life safety checklist, but it's a different realm. But that I agree with your, your yes. consensus. Yeah, I, I, I've read it the same way. There's a life safety section, which has one bullet, just like there's a door section and there's a wall section. I don't think it was a was an overarching statement that, right. the, that the building is safe to inhabit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Well, we have a motion on the floor. Yes. From Commissioner yeah. Adams, seconded by myself, to uh, cover the the expenses of the, the utility bill. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the electrics coming in, right. is there anything further? I just want to keep moving this project forward as fast as possible. As happens. well as I, I, I think we have unanimous consent on that. We want to see this happen sooner than later. So the ladies can get back to work in a nice environment. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner Solari absent. Thank you. Next item, uh, Commissioner Zork. And yes, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Adams uh, needs to depart. Have a wonderful no day. Reflection on your item. <laughs> I'll let him take right, it that way. Is that a second to the motion I'm making as you're going out the door? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Maybe I should wait to see what that motion is. Uh, please go ahead, Commissioner Zorro. Thank you. Um, I know our timing today is not unique where we now have uh, two missing commissioners and the committee that will be working on a number of growth management issues meets tomorrow. But I wanted to paint a little bit of a scenario and maybe with what we're looking at today and the number of commissioners that are remaining is it send this to the committee maybe with a high priority of when you're looking at their making their list of tasks to tackle um, but i'll kind of go through a, a a brief overview of where this came about and to kind of put a couple of items in perspective um, over the last year or so we've had a number of or i have received a number of had a number of conversations and i wouldn't say complaints because everybody, every permitting agency has a process and set of rules, procedures, and codes. And what I hear quite frequently is, you know, staff is following code, but here's where the problems are, are in it. Uh, and this is dealing with when is a traffic study required and at what thresholds, reasonable thresholds, should a traffic study be required. Currently, our Indian River County code states that a traffic study is required for anything that sh the ITE manual indicates it will generate more than 100 trips per day. That's a 24-hour day. Um, going along with that, our community development rules say that from to go from a pre-app conference to a TRC, you have to have a traffic study to basically get agended for that portion. So to put in perspective, what is 100 daily trips per day? So in the ITE manual, um, 832 for a restaurant, that's 560 square feet not a big place to really be generating a lot of uh, trips, but it does, 565 square feet will generate roughly 100 trips. Um, code number 1818, uh, paint hardware, kind of a general store, 1900 square feet requires a traffic study. Um, if you're a daycare center, code number 565, it's 1400 square feet of new or existing, adding on to existing building. Uh, medical, 2,500 square feet, and general commercial, uh, in general, about 1,000 square feet requires a traffic study. So if you've got a 3,500 square foot shop and you, you've been successful and you want to add 1,000 square feet, you, you now are, I don't want to say saddled with, but our code requires that you have to have a traffic study to get through the pipeline. A couple of the unique things that we have in our traffic study that I haven't found in pulling up other traffic studies around the state is kind of the procedures and I think this procedure of the face-to-face -face meeting is appropriate when the scale of the traffic study where you're really doing whether it's a the Devasta waterway village you've got collector roads secondary collector roads state roads you've got a lot of different roads um, that you're looking at in the traffic study but again when you're at a hundred trips having a face-to-face -face interview to s discuss the methodology of the traffic study because the threshold's so low, I think it's putting a lot of applicants 
um, a lot of applicants through additional time, additional expense, and in many cases, I haven't tracked the number, but when you have a pre-op conference, everybody from pre-op doesn't go to TRC, and everybody that goes to TRC doesn't go to completion, because through that process, they realize what their obligations are, what impact fees are, or whatever else they have to do, and they go, hey, this site doesn't work, or the site works, but it's over what my budget is, our company has to spend, or whatever the combination is of why they don't get to the third tier or an approved site plan or plat. Um, in looking around, um, trying to see what is a good goal to have, when should we have them, and I would like to thank the Department of Community Affairs of the state of Georgia, out of all the states that I looked at, and I didn't look at all of them, but I looked at ones that had language that seemed to make a little more sense to me, and I'm not a traffic person, but if I can generally understand it, I think that the really smart traffic engineering people can grasp it probably a lot better, but it ha had some reasonable numbers in it where, where their guidelines were um, 100 peak trips or 750 total daily trips. Either one of those kind of gets you into some additional requirement. And since Rich has been standing at attention here at the podium so well, um, <laughs> we've had this discussion some time back of what would be a good number. Mm -hmm. And I know the committee's meeting tomorrow and we're down two commissioners. So I think probably seeing what the committee what they want to think about this number but i know not putting words in your mouth but i know we've we've chatted about a number before of what is a reasonable application and maybe there's tier one or tier two that if you get into these larger projects the in-depth interview the consultation of having the face-to-face -face on the methodology i think that's appropriate for something that's bigger i just don't know how you define bigger for that for something that's smaller if somebody's doing a a five bay warehouse that they're going to rent out the garages doesn't seem to be that complicated to me that needs a really detailed you know traffic analysis so kind of what's your comments on the podium on the left and then we'll hear our <laughs> comments from the podium on the right as it relates to the trc integration because you can't get to one without the other the way our current code is written First of all, as part of the, it, it's in the code, we're trying to, to make sure we all follow the same rules. Right. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to develop in public works and in community development. Um, to do that, we need to all be on the same page. I don't disagree that the um, traffic, what we require for a traffic study at the threshold of 100 trips or more it is not good for the smaller developments mm -hmm. and it needs to be looked at. Uh, my, the way I look at it is right around 350 is the number I'm looking at. That's the one I'm going to bring up at the committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, but again, that's what the committee's for. There may be reasons to have it at 500 or 750, um, but that's just, it's a starting point. Right. As far as the process is concerned, I will bring up that we have had a couple of projects that have come in and not provided a traffic study at TRC, nor provided a traffic study at the second set of comments, mm -hmm. nor provided a traffic study at the third set of comments. It was only when they were about ready to, to go to construction did a traffic study appear. I think at that, at that, per that particular case you're talking about, they had already signed the contract with the contractor a medical facility at the northern end of the county, maybe one of the same ones you're referring to, and they Damn. they clearly did not follow the rules, and that would clearly be considered a large scale, and mm -hmm. they were really rolling the dice without the traffic study. They may have to revisit the whole site plan process, right. so that really is a good application for that type of And that user. was one of them. There, yeah. was, there was another <laughs> one on the south end of the county that, that uh, functioned the same way through the process, mm -hmm. and that's when we started requiring them to provide the code required traffic studies. Um, the biggest thing is, is it's all about money and timing. Right. If we don't see a traffic study at the get go, then what happens is, is that they have to make changes to their, de their design based on a traffic study. So if we get the traffic study at the very beginning with the TRC, staff can look at it. We can make sure that the traffic study is A, correct, B, if we need improvements in the right away, we can do it at that time. You don't want to get down the road with all the divisions that look at the plans 
and then have to say, oh, your traffic study says you need a right turn lane or left turn lane. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is, is the site plan may change. Right. The access point may change. Mm -hmm. the, the roadway offsite improvements may change. Vintage utilities may change. So it, it's, in, it's important to have the traffic study at the beginning of the project so that we're all on the same page and try to A, streamline the system by having all the information that we need per the code at the beginning, and B, it saves the developer engineering costs to redesign a site after we don't have the traffic study for one or two rounds of comments. So that's the key going back to the right. code. And if I, I could just comment, I, um, you know, in the staff report to the committee that went out last week, you know, we've identified the issue. In fact, Rich is the one who's brought up the threshold uh, question. You know, there's mm -hmm. two questions, and, and Rich commented on both of them, timing, when do you need right. it? really good reasons why you need it up front because right. internal circulation changes too. egress design ingress uh, the, the type of driveway is a major intermediate local uh, minor driveway um, but also uh, when we're talking about the threshold it's a really question of who does the traffic analysis uh, when if you're below a threshold that means that public work staff is going to be doing all the evaluating somebody has to evaluate even the small projects mm -hmm. somebody has to evaluate it uh, and is it all going to be staff or is at some threshold do you have the applicants uh, expert look at it and then have that reviewed and that's a benefit to the applicant at some point so yeah th those questions are all pinpointed in in what we expect to discuss tomorrow and and those will be topics that the committee will look at and come back uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is when we're looking at model codes and looking at what Georgia has mm -hmm. as a code or even the state of Florida has as a code uh, one thing I know has been mentioned at MPO a number of times, in Indian River County, we are in the top five of all counties in the entire country in terms of elderly drivers. Uh, Phil mentioned we're, I, th I think we're number one or number two even in the state in th the age of the drivers and the drivers with disabilities. We have very stringent standards on turn lane requirements here mm -hmm. that will be different than you'll find maybe in a model code because of the type of population of driver we have. So I think there's some local characteristics that we're gonna make sure that when we're looking at our standards for offsite improvements, uh, you know, we can discuss anything, right, in, in the committee, but that's one thing I just wanted to remind the board of that, that the reason why we have certain standards locally for turning movements and that sort of thing is because of the type of population that we have. And that's, that's really Indian River County, not, not necessarily just a, you know, a statewide model code. I wanna just make that point. And, and I think by elevating the number, if that ends up being the number, that's a, a far improvement from where we're currently at. And uh, also the integration, if you have two ways to look at it, one, a peak element or a total number, so that you have you know, two ways to look at how to skin the cat, <clears throat> if you will. And, and, and I think you know, uh, that, uh, that the committee is, that's, that's one of the reasons we have the committee, so we can get different viewpoints. We're getting right. viewpoints from the development community. We're getting viewpoints from the reviewing, uh, the staff that reviews that. And I think it's good that we can hash through those things. And, and I just want to say that what, what my hope has been is to work through that development review committee in a collaborative process. So that's why in the backup you'll see uh, under item 4A, meeting topics, we had come up with, ITAS staff to come up with, uh, based on the board direction, what are some regulations that we think are stumbling blocks and things that, uh, that could, could help streamline the process. So we've, they've got about five of them listed here, uh, and the trip item is, is number three, uh, says staff suggestion, consider raising current threshold that triggers traffic study submittal, existing threshold is 100 daily trips. Um, and this is obviously not an exhaustive list, but I wanted us to come out and say, hey, staff has some ideas too. Uh, let's work collaboratively together to see how we can streamline the process and then obviously I'm sure we'll get many other suggestions from the from the members of the of the development review committee um, but uh, I, I think it's good to have that discussion happen at the development review committee ha talk through these issues regarding the timing and the threshold in, in traffic uh, studies in particular um, and everything in, in general uh, and work through that process so everybody kind of has buy-in when we end up with an end result and we say whatever it is, if it's 250 or 500 or whatever, we've come through a process and, and everybody's worked through that process uh, to, to get to where we, we end up with, with the board's final action. Right. One thing I also like to ask, 
I, some of the items I think the committee will work with will be clearly defined standalone issues. I think traf this traffic study doesn't involve the landscaping code or doesn't involve some other items that if, if they come to a consensus after four meetings on a recommendation on traffic, I'm hoping that those can flow back to us to, to look at and decide how it'll move forward that it doesn't have to wait for some type of final right. report to be. Right, and that's, that's an excellent point. In fact, we made it in one of the staff reports that the committee can, can you know, if we've addressed one issue here, uh, submittal requirements, maybe it's time to get it to the board right. and get some of the low-hanging fruit done mm -hmm. sooner than later. So the some committee will, can certainly do that. Some will be much more complicated or integrated with other items, but there's right. probably will be a few right. that are standalone that can move forward once the committee has some type of consensus and, and they definitely have that ability and, and staff has told them that and we'll tell them that again okay. tomorrow good well thank you very much so i'm thank not going to look for any particular action but if any anybody else up here has any other questions on just, um well let me state that you know i've been sitting here for 11 years and i still think that traffic impact studies are just voodoo magic stuff going on I've never understood how they calculate a trip and there's no logic behind it and so, you know this whole thing is, is for engineers only and, and I wish Jeannie was back here because she is the one who could understand them. Um, but you know I, I think now that we've established this committee I think we need to let them run and yep. um, see what they come up with, see what's their priority. I think we've got enough um, different fields represented there that any concerns to that community should be brought forward. Um, I have full confidence that that staff will work in a very cooperative manner. Um, you know, I think there'll be, you know, some very good give and take. My experience with things like this with staff is that, um, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, no, we, we just can't do that. And, and I think that's good. Uh, sometimes they'll say, yeah, that is a good idea. We can do that. And then sometimes they'll say, well, you know, we really can't do that, but we could do this. And I think um, they'll, and, and I think staff clearly understands that the board, um, you know, we, we do want to try to streamline things to make it as easy as possible. But I think also we want to maintain our standards, the quality of life, the, um, the, the lifestyle standards that the, the community expects out of Indian River County and things like that. So I think, I think staff would, do very good working to improve things, but not not give away what we mm -hmm. what we stand for here. But um, yeah, I, I I just you know I just think we need to let that committee run with it now and stand back and just let them do their thing, and then eventually they'll get things to us and we can move forward. But I think now let's let staff do their job and work with this committee, and um, uh, you know I expect good things out of it. But I think um, we just need to let them run. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I, you know, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I, you know, we've, we've shared the same 11 years, and I didn't get the voodoo magic thing out of this. <laughs> uh, what I did get is sine, cosine, tangent, and variables that are an uh, al algebraic equations that are very difficult to explain. So no fault by the, the traffic engineers. Uh, and yes, Jeannie did a, a fantastic job. I did get that out of it. Uh, but uh, it's it's a very difficult concept, but that's why, if you recall, when we selected the committee, mm -hmm. that I complimented all of my peers as the the person the personnel that they selected to be appointed to the committee. I think we have the cream of the crop, mm -hmm. and, and and I'm expecting great results working with our staff and coming up with positive solutions to make it a better place. So, I, 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 and I, it's already on the agenda uh, for the committee to work, and I look forward to the results. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any Thanks. Any further commissioners? Well? Nope, we're good. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll uh, move on. We'll uh, change hats and move to the Solid Waste Disposal District, and I'm looking for approval of the approval minutes. Approval of minutes of July 18 and August 15, 2017. Second. And that's a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Zork. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Just, 
Go, I'm sorry, Mr. I Mayor. just got to finish that sentence. With just you. a question for Dylan, just to remind me. When we're down to three commissioners like this, a, a two to one vote doesn't pass anything, right? It has to be three votes to pass anything. Is that correct? Yes, you need an affirmative vote of at least three commissioners. Right, so with only three of us, even though a two to one would be a majority vote, it doesn't meet our standard of three. That is correct. That's what I, I just wanted to make sure. Just. But it looks like we're all going with Although I apologize because under our rules, it's the chair who is the uh, the answerer of all key type those types of issues. But that is straight out of the I, I would have thrown that. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I figured this one would Always be good to have it. Anyway. <laughs> I'll consult the, we now have uh, three positive votes, and uh, we well, that's uh, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. And we now have three positive votes, and that's with Commissioner Solari and Commissioner Adams absent. It's three to zero. Uh, with that, we're now moving forward. Uh, thanks for the clarification. And we're now moving forward to the quarterly annual recycling update for the year 2016-2017. Good, good afternoon. Just, no, it's still good morning. It, it is morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Stephanie Fonville, the recycling coordinator for the Solid Waste Disposal District. Um, it is that time again for the quarterly recycling update for fiscal year 16-17. Uh, We're on the fourth quarter now. Um, so taking a look at the last three months, <coughs> July, August, and September um, for fiscal year 16-17, that's in the green. Uh, it's fluctuated a little bit compared to 15-16. Um, we had some, the tonnages were a little bit lower this year in July and September, but they were higher in August. Um, so looking at the fourth quarter as a whole, we actually had a net increase in recycling tonnages of about 3%, um, with August being our, being our highest month here. Uh, if we do take a step back and look kind of over the months uh, at this past year, um, the green line again is 15, is 1617, and the blue line is 1516. In general, our tonnages in 1617 have been higher. Again, with a couple, with a little bit of fluctuation, sometimes dipping below 1516. Um, but the important thing is this now shows two full years of single stream recycling. And if we take a look at where we were with dual stream recycling. Um, we're, we're still higher. We're still higher in every single month. Um, so we're excited to see that. So looking at the numbers as a whole, in 1617, we reached 20,279 tons, um, which was higher than what we had last year at 18,600 tons. And it also reaches our internal goal of 20,000 um, ton, uh, uh, tons of recycling. So we're really excited to see that. And again, we always like to point out where these were two years of single stream. Looking back at dual stream, we were at 12,000 tons. So uh, we have been making a difference with single stream. Um, I still hear a lot of positive reports. A lot of people like those blue recycling carts. Um, and I'm, I'm just so glad that we're, we're there with Indian River County and, and our blue carts. It's fantastic. Want to, could you back up one slide? Sure. Please? Thank you. Um, I think it was a portion of our, our gain between 1415 and 1516, some of the C and D data that we received, Actually, or is this separate from that? This would be separate from that. Okay. So this shows single stream recycling and any of our household hazardous waste, electronics, scrap metals, um, anything okay. like that that comes through the landfill. So this is actually this is actually the community stepping up and and uh, bringing these recycling okay. to us. So um, because I think you to that everybody. that data they're just going to send to us annually the C and D folks that um, so we may have on those reporting numbers it may trail and then. We have to backfeed the the data once we get it from them and backfeed the year to kind of true up the reports and and that has increased our overall number right so this is w one of those pieces of the pie and then but the overall piece of the pie of recycling has gone up significantly right. uh in in large part due to the to capturing that cnd mm -hmm. uh recycling that's going on out there absolutely that's correct mm -hmm. Um, so we have been continuing our collection events. We had a um, household hazardous waste and electronics event in August at the Intergenerational Recreation Center. Uh, we had about 265 cars come through. It's a little bit higher than what we had in January. It was about 230 cars. Uh, we collected 9,700 pounds of electronics. Again, that's a little bit higher. We had about 8,000 at our last event. Um, so it's growing and that we still have a couple more folks coming out. Um, but really where we see a lot of our community come out is for those paper shredding events. We do have one coming up on November 18th on Saturday. Um, it's from 9 to 2, and it'll be at Southeast Secure Shredding's facility off of US-1. So that's coming up next month. Um, so come join us for that. So if you do you have a, an electronic uh, version of the flyer there for the recycle event? 
Yes. Could you send that uh, to Tina so we'll look, blast that out to my email list? Sure, absolutely. Right. We have it up on our website, but I can, I can send it to her as okay. well. So um, we do have that. One of the campaigns that we wanted to start this, uh, the, during the fourth quarter, we had planned to send these out in September, it was a um, postcard mailer, which we would send to every residential address in Indian River County. So that's all the PO boxes and all the residential addresses. Um, now this postcard would have general information about recycling, what can go in there, and then some of the key things that we really don't want in those blue carts. Um, and on the backhand side, one of the things that I, I am really excited about with this is that it tells people not only what can't go in there, but why it can't go in there. Um, I get a lot of those questions. People call me wondering why we can't um, put the plastic caps or the shredded paper in there. This explains that and some of the issues that they have at the sorting facility. Um, so I, I'm really excited to kind of get that information out there, out in the community, get people talking about it, and of course they can call me with questions. Um, the other thing that this postcard mailer does is it directs people to our website if they want to get more information, if they want to know about the recycling events or, the, or um, details about the program, um, they can go to our website. And one way to bring them to our website, we actually um, created a survey. We wanted to get some feedback from the community um, on what they thought about the recycling program and the garbage program. Are they having any issues? Um, with flies in their garbage? Are they, do they know about the recycling event? All these types of questions, we've created a survey um, and, we, and Target actually generously donated a $100 gift card for us to raffle off um, and actually Countryside Citrus and a couple of other uh, local um, uh, businesses have also expressed interest in, in um, giving prizes for these surveys. So we wanted to get this out in September. Unfortunately, the timing um, did not work out. This was supposed to come out the week after the hurricane and with the suspension of recycling, we decided that was probably not the best time. Um, so we would like to send these out uh, perhaps the end of this month, maybe next month when things have cleared up a little bit more. So we have this on reserve, but it is prepared and, and essentially ready to go. Um, so that's one of our newest campaigns. And then another thing that I am working on that I am really excited about, um, it's an Indian River County School Recycling Pilot Program. Um, so essentially the goal of this program is to provide tools for campus-wide recycling at four selected schools. And if this is successful, we're hoping that it'll serve as a model and we can expand this to the other schools. Um, right now they have a recycling dumpster at most of the schools. It gets picked up once a week, but they don't have the tools inside to get the staff and the students and the teachers involved. Um, so we've applied for two grants to try to get the money to pay for these, these containers. We um, applied to the Waste Management Think Green grant program, and I'm happy to say that we actually received that grant. So a big thank you to Waste Management for um, that monetary donation. It's about $2,500 to help us buy those containers. And we have submitted and are waiting to hear back from a, another grant from the, the uh, Curtin Council um, to see if they'll partner with us to get this going. So this will be a group effort. Um, we're really excited. It'll be the Freshman Learning Center um, we'll bring containers to Storm Grove Middle School, Pelican Island Elementary, and Rosewood Magnet Elementary. Those are the schools that we're meeting with and I'm currently working with and, and um, getting all the details together. So we're ready to go once we hear back. Um, and then we had a discussion with the superintendent of the school about that pilot program and that kind of brought on some more discussions about um, recycling at the football games. So I, I'm really happy to say that the um, school district worked with waste management and there is actually recycling carts at the Vera Beach High School and the Sebastian um, River High School <coughs> football stadiums and they are recycling during their home games. Um, so that was just another positive um, effort that came out of that. So we're really getting recycling into the schools and um, that is all that I have for you today. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for putting uh, recycling at the forefront where it needs to be. Thank you. Yeah, no questions, but glad to hear things are going good. Thank you. So far, so good. Well, thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, with that, seeing nothing further on the agenda, and before we're, we're, we're at the bare minimum on uh, commissioners, so uh, before we lose any more, meeting adjourned.